We're going to call the uh, meeting of the Oil and Gas Commission, Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, to order. I'm Howard Boygan, serving as chair today in the absence of Commissioner Benton, who couldn't be here. Uh, welcome, all of you. Glad to see you here. Um, I think our first order of business is the uh, roll call of commissioners. Chair Boygan. Present. Vice Chair Holton. Here. Commissioner Ager. Here. Commissioner Hawkins. Here. Commissioner Jolly. Here. Commissioner Overter. Here. Commissioner Randall. Commissioner Wolk. Mr. Chair, I have one, two, three, four, five, six out of nine present. Thank you, Ms. Prine. <coughs> so our first order of business is public comments. And um, Mr. Davenport, you want to um, announce who the commenters are and what the procedure is going to be? I'm happy to. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we have both online signups as well as signups at the front door today. We will, pursuant to our procedure, be going with the online signups first, and then the folks who signed up at the meeting this morning, uh, also pursuant to our process, elected officials will have the option to go first, no matter when they signed up. And so, and elected officials will also receive five minutes. Everyone else will receive three minutes for their public comment. I have my little machine up here, which shows lights, so you know approximately how much time you have left. Yellow shows when you have 30 seconds left. I also have a sign that I'll hold up when you have 30 seconds left. And we're going to ask everybody to please conclude your comments right when your time is up so that we have time to get to everybody. Um, just so I think we've had a discussion here today. We have some people who are on the online sign up who want to speak to um, official Commission business. They've been talking. They talk about continuances in their comments. We would uh, we're going to exercise our discretion. The commission is going to exercise its discretion to move those folks to the end of the public comment, so that everyone who signed up, who uh, other than official commission business, can uh, speak first. So we're going to start with Senator Jones, and then Councilwoman Elise Jones. And those are the only elected officials I have on my list. If you're an elected official, I want Senator Jones and, and Councilwoman Jones speak. If you could just simply raise your hand, we'd appreciate it. Thank you. Senator Jones, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, members, for the opportunity to talk today. I want you to remember two numbers, 15 and 4. 15 and 4. 15 explosions in 2017 related oil and gas operations four deaths. You might remember the Bruce Finley uh, uh, Denver Post article that talked about tw uh, at least 12. Well, they, he didn't include Firestone as 13, and there were two more in Weld County in December, making 14 and 15. So the two people were killed in Firestone, another one killed in Meade, another one killed in Briggsdale. Your job is to protect us, first and foremost. Over permit issuance, it's to protect us. I don't see that happening. The, and I've heard, well, you know, we have to do what the statute says. Well, the statute says consistent with public health and safety and the environment. Consistent with. That's what the Martinez case is on. Even if that's turned over, it still says consistent with. One in five permits now is issued within 1,000 feet of an occupied structure. One in five. That can't go on. That's why people are so nervous about these things coming near them. And that doesn't include the health effects that could be affecting their children. I think you're going to hear about that today. All, else, all one has to do is look at your consent agenda and know this is a permit mill. Over and over every year, every month, it's permit, permit, permit. And you spend hardly any time allowing wells to go near people, allowing them to have their private property turned into somebody else's private property for corporate gain, and not a peep. 
if people saw this, if regular people saw how quickly those things happened and understood them, there'd be a riot. I want you to take a tour of Well County, Erie. I want you to drive around that town. Have somebody that knows the town show you. And ask yourself, would you allow your family to live there? If what happened in Erie happened in Denver and Colorado Springs, we'd have a whole different thing here. But the bottom line is you're supposed to protect people. And we have two corporations, Extraction and Crestone, wanting to come into Boulder County, who would, and Anadarko for that, model, for that matter, whose business model is to put these near neighborhoods or in neighborhoods. That's just not right. Your job is to protect us, and you have the authority to do it. I've heard people say, oh, it's the statute's limits us. It really does not. We have very weak financial rules and statute. And you have strong ones that are still very weak, but you've made them stronger than what the state requires. You can do that with protection of people. You can get rid of the three huge loopholes and the setback requirements, the 500 feet and the 1,000 feet. They're Swiss cheese. They're bragged about a lot, but you can put them where there's current wells. You can put them near within the 500 feet in a city if you get approval of you. Or in rural areas, all it takes is the directors. Okay. They're not really setback rules. So bottom line, your job is to protect us. You can do that. You have corporations that are, think it's more important to make their profit than to protect people. Fifteen explosions at least and four deaths. And this isn't an anomaly. All you got to do is look back. There's other places and other times that this kind of thing has happened. The family in Firestone no longer has a dad or an uncle. The kid's there. One kid jumped out the second floor window to survive that. And the wife's home, assumingly, after going to the hospital for severe burns. That's not okay. You can't of these near people. You have the authority to do it. Please protect us. Please do that. That's the way it should go for all of you. So protect us, 15 and 4. Whenever you make a decision, I want you to think 15 and 4. Whenever you get up in the morning and you look in the mirror, I want you to say 15 and 4 and say, I need to protect those people. Priority. The profit doesn't matter. The people do. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Senator. Commissioner Jones, welcome. Good morning, everyone. My name is Elise Jones. I'm a Boulder County Commissioner, and I appreciate the opportunity to be here today to talk with you. The COGCC, in public statements and in legal proceedings, has repeatedly attempted to reassure Colorado citizens that it listens to local concerns when considering the location and development of new oil and gas wells. Indeed, the COGCC rules indicate that the Commission will provide local public whole forums in certain instances, and that local governments can intervene in proceedings, quote, as a matter of right, end quote. However, Boulder County has repeatedly found that its efforts to be heard and its efforts to ensure that its citizens are heard have been stifled at every turn. Every request the county has made to more actively involve the public has been de denied by the COGCC. What's more, every effort for the county to intervene in a development application proceeding has been met with resistance, and in several cases, we've been completely denied the ability to participate. For example, our request for a local public forum involving eight Norris applications to drill 52 wells in Boulder County was denied under an overly strict reading of the rule that did not acknowledge the significant density of the development that eight North is proposing. Then our protests on the 8 North drilling and spacing unit and additional density applications were dismissed because they purportedly didn't state our concerns specifically enough, despite the fact that 8 North itself did not and would not provide any specifics about their plans that we were going to be able to respond to. Then our second protest to one of the 8 North DSUs on a new legal issue was denied for being late. We filed it several months before the hearing date and asked for leave to file, but our request was never answered and the protest was summarily denied. 
Up until now, most of these denials have all been handled at the staff or hearing officer level. So I want to make sure the commission knows what's going on here. The upshot is that we don't feel like we've been provided the opportunity to fully present to the COGCC our concerns about threats to public health, safety, and welfare, including the protection of our environment and open space. So just to be crystal clear, what we're asking for is the opportunity to participate in the COGCC proceedings, to have a seat at the table, to be heard. As you know from my repeated appearances before you, I think this is number five in the last six months, my constituents are very concerned about and very opposed to the, the proposals pending in Boulder County for intensive drilling near homes and on open space purchased with taxpayer dollars. If we continue to be denied the opportunity to present these concerns to you, it sends the message to citizens and local governments across the state that the COGCC does not care what communities have to say and is focused only on the voices of industry. Thank you for hearing me today. Um, Director Murphy, are you familiar with the specifics of the of each of the matters that Commissioner Jones referred to? I believe I have the same understanding of what she relayed in that um, untimely petitions were dismissed, um, but I would have to defer to Ms. Prine or Hearing Officer Rouse for more specifics. Okay, is staff prepared to comment? I'd like to hear some comment about what happened. Um, and if you're not prepared, then perhaps you can um, uh, look into it over the next couple of days while we're still in session and report back to us. Yes, yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other elected officials in the audience who'd like to speak today? All right, then we'll re we'll turn to the online signups. I'm going to call three names in order, and if you have time, if you can please be ready to come up uh, when your name is called, that would be much appreciated. I want to remind everybody that everyone has three minutes, and you'll see a yellow light, and I'll hold up a sign when you have 30 seconds left. So the first three people are Becky Roberts, James Hergenritter, and Julia Williams. My name is Becky Roberts. I live at 714 in Bowdoin Mile Road in Watkins, Colorado. The Swan site that is proposed is an anomaly. There are 55 families that will be trapped and cannot escape our homes if it's allowed to be put in. I am a homeowner in Watkins Farm, a member of the Watkins Task Force, and representing 72 other homeowners who signed this petition requesting an alternate site analysis. In July of 2017, Arapahoe County Planning Division promised in writing that ConocoPhillips and Prosper Farms would be required to conduct an authentic alternative site analysis. None has been done. In 2012 and 2016, according to campaign finance records, Arapahoe County commissioners accepted multiple campaign donations from Mr. and Mrs. Barney Pfizer, owners of Prosper Farms and Furniture Row, and Prosper Farms representative Jeff Vogel. This is concerning because Vogel began presenting Prosper Farms' preliminary development plan to Arapahoe County commissioners in 2012 for their approval. Is this why the county refuses to grant a use by special review or to conduct an alternative site analysis? Precedents for moving sites have already been set in Colorado. In 2014, Great Western Oil and Gas planned the PACE site close to two Windsor subdivisions. Matt Lepore, then COGCC director, stated, Rather than shoehorning it in, have you looked for alternatives? Great Western CEO said, the company is looking to work with the community. In October of 2015, Great Western and the landowner did negotiate an alternate location for PACE. Is Conoco a company looking to work with our community? Prosper Farms owns eight square miles of cornfields and Conoco owns the mineral rights. Our attorney, Matt Sura, has researched alternative site locations to get at these minerals. Is the landowner, Prosper Farms, willing to negotiate with us? 
On April 4th, 2018, this year, residents expressed our concerns for having to evacuate toward the well, fire or explosion, using 6th Avenue or the yet-to-be-built emergency road. The fire chief's response to us was that our families in 55 homes would have to shelter in place. For our safety, require ConocoPhillips and Prosper Farms to negotiate a site further away from our community. And I have handouts. Do I give those? To Is Mr. Hergenreiter here? Yes. Okay, you're next, sir. Thank you. I'm a little taller. <laughs> um, my family is from Longmont, Colorado, and we have wells, uh, horizontal wells, getting put in on our property right now. And I would like the oil company to have easements for part of those wells to bring the oil up on our farm out of the wellheads, even though it's 7,500 feet in the ground. I mean, in the United States, we theoretically own the property to the center of the earth. So, uh, and here's why I think we need to have easements, even though I know you guys can't do nothing directly about it. If you don't have anything in your paperwork that says, do you have easements in place for a horizontal well? I think the little check mark ought to be on the forums because uh, the perfect example of why I think this, when they initially came out and talked to us about putting the horizontal wells in, the land man says, well, geez, we'll just put a bunch of vertical ones in if you, uh, and put them all down the line here and do it that way if you don't want to have the horizontal wells. Uh, well, that would be interesting. I said, go ahead and do that because as you cross all the property lines, here on the surface, you're gonna to wanna to join all them wellheads together. So the gathering lines are gonna cross all the property lines and you're gonna to have to have easements for those pipelines, okay? In the past, over the last 40 years, in our section and the surrounding sections, there's been 15 to 20 wells put in and they virtually paid for easements for the gathering lines, uh, whether you had a well in your property or not. Um, to put all them wells together, okay? So why shouldn't they pay for an easement for a horizontal well that crosses those same property lines? And, and I really think that they need to, need to look at that because uh, they also have crossed on our property uh, industrial lots that we're considering putting in and they have nothing there for a surface use agreement or damage agreement on those uh, uh, pieces of property. But the pipelines that are initially put in that are converted wells after you frack them and, and perf the pipe, um, the technology is there. If you put a mile and a half uh, pipe down the, the ground and put another pipe down at the end, you could get... You could just use it for a gathering line too. It's just a pipe in the ground. So uh, I'm gonna continue with this process and go see representatives, senators, whatever, because the oil companies I think are circumventing the rules to have easements for horizontal wells to bring the off lease oil that comes through that and comes through our property. And sir, sir I'm sorry, could you state your name again? J Jim Hergenreiter. Thank you. He pronounced it just right. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. Hergenreiter, before you leave, um, sorry, I have a question. Um, are you a lessor? Have you um, issued oil and gas leases to any of these companies? Are you a surface owner or what? We're a surface owner, and my dad had an old, old lease from 40 years ago that they're using to drill these wells. So... We own the property and the mineral rights. You, you leased the surface for easements, or you leased... Or you have the minerals as well? We have the minerals as well. And there's an old lease that's being maintained by production that's being drilled? Uh, the old old lease, they're closing up all the wells. They're doing them shut in and plugging them. But 
the lines that joined them all together, uh, they paid everybody for an easement. I mean, it was. I went to the, the county and looked up the paperwork for that. Every got everybody got paid for a gathering line that joined all the the vertical wells and the directional wells that are there. And those vertical and directional wells that are there already uh, don't even cover the same distance that the horizontal well that they're putting in is even longer than that distance. So my other question is, do you have an attorney? Oh, yes. Okay. I've told this to several of them. I even have a, a business that uh, uh, sells organic product, and when people come to my business, they point to this one, they point to that one, and <laughs> they say, why do you have a have that in your backyard? And and uh, well, I get in conversations with them, and, and geez, everybody that I've ever discussed this with uh, about having an easement for a horizontal well, and when you're standing right there and physically can see everything that I'm talking about, um, I'd take the first 12 people off the street to have a jury because everybody agrees with it. Sir, my suggestion is simply that you talk with an attorney to tell you, to advise you what your legal rights are in that situation and, and see if there's any action that you can take. Yeah, we've, we've already done that. We've already talked with the oil company and the abuse of the oil company of the pooling rules that you guys have is what they threw at us. They said, we pooled your oil together. Uh, we can do this. Well, I've called down here, and I think I even talked to Julie at one time, and I, I voiced this to two or three people and described this already to them, and it seemed like a new thing to uh, bring this up. But your pooling rules don't give anybody an easement to cross your property and bring other off-lease oil through your property. Isn't that right? I'm not going to comment. Yeah. <laughs> Get a lawyer. Because it, yeah, it pulls the oil together. It doesn't make an easement. Thank you, sir. Okay. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Yeah. Ms. Williams. Do you need me to state my name or? Okay, yeah, my name is Julia Williams and I am from Golden, Colorado. I'd like to start off my comments with an official request to move the time for public comment to a time that is more conducive for the public to actually be able to comment. Many of the reason you see many of our faces, familiar faces here every time, is because so many of the people that we represent are not able to take 9 a.m. off on a Monday morning. So I would officially like to request that it is moved to an afternoon time or an alternate time where public can actually come and participate in this process. I wanted to take some time to talk to you guys today about the definitions of your mission and your values that are listed on your website. The COGCC defines that responsible development of oil and gas in Colorado will result in the efficient exploration and production of oil and gas resources in a manner consistent with the protection of public health and safety and welfare. However, the COGCC continues to disregard peer-reviewed studies that show clear correlation between public health issues and hydraulic fracturing. You say that responsible development will re result in the prevention of waste. However, at least 239 billion gallons of wastewater have been produced from fracking since at least 2005. You say responsible development will result in the protection of mineral owners' correlative rights. However, force pooling does not protect the right of Coloradans. In fact, the deck is heavily stacked against community members when a leasing permit comes to their door. You say that res responsible development will result in the prevention and mitigation of adverse environmental impacts. However, in 2014 alone, bringing new fracked wells into production released at least 5.3 billion pounds of methane. And additionally, infrastructure to support fracking has permanently damaged at least 679,000 acres of land in Colorado since 2005. Now I want to talk to you about your values. The COGCC said it is, it is committed to earning the trust of the people of Colorado every day. However, the COGCC continues to fail the people of Colorado. Instead of responding adequately to complaints and public comment, our voices are ignored and oil and gas interests are prioritized. Our attempts to engage are instead fought with resistance and loopholes that prevent our communities from having any ability to engage in the decision-making process. 
You say you conduct your work with integrity, technical excellence, and a commitment to innovation. But the definition of integrity is to have the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. If you are truly operating with integrity, you would drop the Martinez appeal. You would institute an emergency moratorium since you do not have the funding to complete the job that you need to do, and you wouldn't approve permits for new operators who have no proven record of safety or profit. You say that you provide exceptional customer service, that you are responsive, fair, and consistent. However, thousands of complaints continue to go unnoticed. You say that you will improve every day, but you have not made any noticeable efforts to improve regulations to protect Colorado communities. If these are your values, if these are how you choose to define the mission and operation of your agency, then I'm here to request that you actually hold yourself to them. Thank you. Heidi Hinkle, Connie Beach, and Harry Gregory are our next three commenters. Hi, I'm Heidi Hankel, and I'm an unaffiliated voter from Broomfield. I'm a stay-at-home mom who is missing her yoga pants right now. <laughs> I taught high school math and science for 10 years in public schools. I represent the Broomfield Moms Active Community, which has 189 members. It is a nonpartisan group of moms who lead nonprofits, participate in their children's schools and PTOs, while some are tending to their disabled children and learning who is and isn't protecting them and their children. We support the most vulnerable populations, and we decided that children are at the top of this list. I've been recently trying to explain to moms who are just trying to feed their babies all day how the state and city governments work, especially after 84 wells have been proposed so close to our schools. I want to catch us up to speed on what the moms have witnessed so far. We came last fall to watch four hours of testimony here to include cancer and nosebleeds, and the citizens were not heard. Nothing was changed at the CUGCC. I was in the Senate committee hearing when Senator Sonnenberg yelled at us and told us we could not say explosions in testimony as it relates to our health and safety. Our microphones were cut off and the bill that would have elevated health and safety was killed. Tracy Bentley from the Petroleum Council and other industry representatives have repeatedly testified that they cannot afford to elevate our health and safety above oil and gas operations. They won't even give mercy to move their operations 1,000 feet away from school playgrounds and high occupancy stadiums. I was in that bill hearing last Thursday as well. Our school district and city council are getting frustrated. Our citizens are starting to wonder, what can the industry afford? The industry lines the pockets of our politicians and we are taking notice. A Republican representative in the bill for the thousand foot setbacks from school playgrounds also asked us, have any children died yet? <laughs> and then they point to you as in control of these setbacks. We are tired of everyone pointing fingers and nothing being done. We are done being silenced, and this is what's happened and what will happen statewide in 2018. Broomfield passed a citizen-led and constitutionally sound initiative to elevate the health and safety above oil and gas operations. We fought a half a million dollar budget with $12,000 and the citizens spoke. I will quote, quote Tracy again, oil and gas cannot afford to elevate our health above our, their operations, so in my opinion, they cannot afford to operate in Broomfield. Our citizens spoke. Erie just won trustee positions to protect life. They fought against a more than $75,000 to pay for city political campaigns from oil and gas. Oil and gas money lost and the citizens spoke. I want to tell you why oil and gas keeps losing in political battles in our communities. Oil and gas is unwilling to compromise and the CUGCC is unwilling to change. The voters are noticing and I'm worried about the industry's self-defeating actions if the CUGCC doesn't start changing the way you do business. You have the authority, but you choose not to use it. New attorneys are running for state and city uh, office, and where they're going to be voted in because they're willing to make oil and gas companies face their environmental crimes. Thank you. My name is Connie Beach. I'm here representing my husband and my 12-year-old son. I live in Adams County, and more, more specifically, I live in the Springvale neighborhood, which is on 136th and Holly. I'm here today to express my extreme displeasure with the force-pulling methods of the oil and gas industry. This 67-year-old rule enables the oil and gas operators to combine mineral rights of a group of property owners into a dangerous and dirty drilling site. 
even if the property owners do not consent. It is corporate eminent domain that has been allowed to go on far too long. It is forcing private citizens into a quasi-partnership with a private for-profit industry that is not concerned about the health and safety of the communities that it destroys. These antiquated rules do not reflect the current horizontal invasion of people's rights and property. Private property cannot be taken for private use, and this is exactly what force pooling does. Those of us who do not want to go into business with the oil and gas operators through force pooling are experiencing First Amendment violation of our freedom of association. This coercive method of the oil and gas industry allows trespass on my property, which I do not consent. I do not want to be held liable for the actions of the oil and gas operators and refuse to lease my mineral rights. Because I am refusing, I will be force pooled, meaning I will be liable for all spills, poisonings, accidents, and fines of the oil and gas operator, even though I have expressly voiced my opposition to the site. Does this sound like the American way? I am here today as a holdout. I am not here today as a holdout for a better deal. I am not interested in a deal with the oil and gas industry. I am here because I don't want them to trespass on my property with their dangerous for-profit venture. I do not want them poisoning the ground, releasing dangerous pollutants into the air, and packing up in the middle of the night, leaving a nightmare drilling site one quarter of a mile from my house. As an American, I should have the right to say no to anyone wanting to trespass on my property. And the government should not be allowing a private, for-profit company to simply take what they want over my extreme objections. While I know my testimony here will do little to nothing in persuading this commission to disallow this First Amendment violation while cowardly standing behind a law enacted in 1951, my voice should be heard. My neighbors' voices should be heard. The voices of the people suffering from chronic health issues due to pollutants should be heard. Because I am sure that future generations will look back at the mess we've made of our great state of Colorado and wonder exactly what this bought and paid for commission was thinking when they allowed this to happen to their citizens. Any questions? I have a question. Is there a specific um, docket number or is the, is the pooling I put the docket number on my uh, email when I, when I signed up online. There's a docket number. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Is this the toll? This is the, I'm sorry, is this the tollway site? Uh, no, the, there, well, there's like a dozen of them out there where I live, but the one that they want to put in a quarter mile from my house is the tower site. The, the, the tower site? The tower site. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Harry Gregory, Hal Ryder, and then Wendy Engelman, please. Commissioners, my name is Harry Gregory. I moved to Denver from Centennial three months ago so I could participate in more of these hearings and those at the Capitol. I listen to the heart-wrenching stories from people whose lives are affected by oil and gas operations. I watch you listen, but nothing changes. The process isn't working. They don't face a militarized occupation, but they might as well live at Standing Rock for the consideration their concerns are given. I invite you to mentally stand up, push in your chairs, and come sit among us for the rest of the public comments. I would like to direct a word to employees of the oil and gas industry. That word is resume. When your company's bottom line depends on making people sick and killing them, it's time to look for another job. Arguing that your paycheck somehow justifies the harm your employer is doing to people and planet makes you an accomplice. I faced a similar dilemma when I worked in Chicago. Marshall Fields was interviewing for someone to expand carpet, wood, and tile floors as part of their commercial interiors division at the Merchandise Mart. Marshall Fields was a prestigious name in Chicago, like Saks Fifth Avenue in New York City. I wanted the job, and I got it. Shortly after I started, I learned that Marshall Fields had become a subsidiary of Brown and Williamson Tobacco. I felt like I had just won the lottery only to find out there were irreconcilable strings attached. For a while I told myself, 
if I don't do this job, someone else will, you probably do the same thing. Any kids in your life are going to see through your rationalizations, so start planning your next move. They will respect you for it. The industry argues that ending fossil fuel use will hurt the economy. It's like our grandparents' generation arguing that we can't transition the economy from building trucks and cars to tanks and planes while it's still recovering from the Great Depression. Responding to the existential threat will have to wait for a more convenient time. It's untrue and unpatriotic. The only better time to scale up a clean energy economy would have been 30 years ago. I would like to address a few words to the governor also. Your time is up. The agency responsible for public health, safety, welfare, environment, and wildlife has been co-opted. We have a to-do list for you and anyone who wants to be governor of Colorado. Ban new COGCC permits, end the Martinez appeal, revoke permits issued since the Martinez decision, and establish a climate emergency department in the governor's office. We will deliver these demands to you in person and remind all of you, you work for us. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Hal Ryder, land manager at Great Western Operating Company. Uh, I'm here to provide an update on several comments that Great Western received at the March 19th hearing regarding a Great Western drilling and spacing unit application that was approved in docket number 1803-00132 for the tollway unit. At the March 19th hearing, the commission addressed public comments received for the tollway spacing application. Our company listened to these public comments and we have con conducted outreach to all 15 individuals who either made public comments or filed a, a Rule 510 statement to the tollway unit spacing application following the March hearing. Great Western's pooling application for the tollway unit is scheduled to be heard on the consent agenda today in docket number 1804-00314. Um, as our council explained to you all in the March hearing, Great Western goes above and beyond what is required by, the, uh, required by the commission rules and provides advance notice and descriptions of its spacing and pooling applications in plain language to its interested parties. For the tollway unit, we sent a pre-application introduction letter to each unleased mineral interest owner within the unit on January 5th, 2018, which was five days prior to Great Western filing its uh, spacing application. Um, uh, and and it, it w this was approximately 120 days in advance of this hearing today. This letter included an offer to lease and described exactly what the unleased mineral owners would be receiving from Great Western in the process of spacing, permitting, and pooling the proposed wells, including the sequence of uh, an offer to lease, Grace West, Great Western spacing application, election letters, and finally, Great Western's pooling application. In addition to this letter contained a detailed map showing the location of the unit, the location of each neighborhood within the unit, the proposed wells, and the, so and the surface location of Great Western's pads identified by street intersections and not to just township range and section. Great Western mailed its election letters to each unleased mineral interest owner and working interest owner in the tollway unit on February 5th, 2018 which was approximately 90 days prior to this hearing today. Included in our election letter was a brief summary of statutory pooling uh, within the state of Colorado. Great Western is committed to addressing the concerns and questions of the interested parties subject to our applications, which is why we believe it's important to provide clear notice of our spacing and pooling applications in plain language and to send out our offers to lease and, and uh, election letters out at least 90 days before hearing a pooling application in order to ensure that all questions or concerns are addressed. As I indicated, Great Western's pooling application for today's uh, tollway unit in docket number Mr. 18. Mr. Ryder, I'm sorry, your time's up, sir. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Ryder, I'm, I'm sorry. I have a couple of questions. Sure. And, and if you've got something that you want to finish saying, go ahead. Um, you know, 
Ruling application is on the uh, consent agenda today. Yeah, 18040314. Yes. Um, no formal protests have been filed. Uh, and however, there were three Rule 510 statements made. As with the comments made in the spacing application in March, Great Western has conducted outreach to all three individuals uh, who filed the Rule 510 statements to the pooling. That's and, it. And so what was the result of that outreach? Well, uh, ultimately, we invited all of the parties to our Adams County a ASUR uh, outreach meeting. What's um, an ASUR? It's the uh, Adams County permitting process. Uh, there were a few of the parties that did show up. There were a few questions asked back from us, uh, mainly operational questions that we answered, um, but there was really not a lot of response to our outreach. So when you say you've engage in outreach, that means you've attempted to contact or you've actually engaged in, in some kind of communication with them? We have made comments. We have, we have made contact. You've made contact with all of them? Yes. The ones who commented? Yes. And, and it, we went above and beyond and invited them to our outreach, our Adams County outreach uh, community meeting last Thursday night. And are the concerns uh, centered on forced pooling or are there other concerns? Mainly, you know, they had operational questions. Um, I've noticed that are, there are a couple of people here who've signed up who may have comments on the tollway site. I'm not sure. So if you do, when you comment, can you please make that clear? Um, but, um, but I appreciate your comments today. Sure. Thank you all. Wendy Engelman, Gary Norton, and Shana Oliver. I'm Wendy Engelman, and for the record, that man previously, Tom, I am one of those people. I'm in an unwanted and um, unrequested relationship with Great Western Oil that was force pooled, and I don't recall him ever having reached out or extended any communication. Thanks. My name is Wendy Engelman. I was a public school teacher for 30 years in Adams schools. Erin Martinez was a colleague of mine until she was forced to quit teaching because of third-degree burns she suffered over 50% of her body in a home explosion that killed her husband and brother. That explosion was the direct result of negligence on the part of multiple corporations, the state of Colorado, and this commission. Because of my background in education, I was at the Capitol building with thousands of other teachers last week rallying for increased funding. I had no awareness of big oil and gas in Colorado until last year when not only did the preventable tragedy in Firestone occur, but this commission also forced pulled my husband and I into a relationship with Great Western Oil, which we neither want nor approve of. Since that time a year ago, I have learned there is a strong connection between big oil and gas in Colorado and the lack of education funding. In both Oklahoma and Colorado, big oil and gas are getting a hell of a bargain. They're offered incentives, self-regulation, subsidies, rebates, and even state government bailouts. When a project goes poorly, the company walks away from it, leaving the taxpayers to pick up the bill for the orphaned well. As a result, the state of Colorado has neither the money to fully fund the future of our children, nor the money to hire independent folks to monitor the more than 50,000 active wells and 20,000 inactive wells to make sure safety and environmental regulations are followed. The state of Colorado has only three inspector, had only three inspectors on staff at the time of the explosion in Firestone, negligent and inexcusable. I don't want Colorado to be like Oklahoma anymore. I don't want you to keep rubber stamping those proposals without an investment from these companies that more than covers the cost of their doing business. I want to be like Wyoming and Alaska, and I never thought I'd hear this, myself say this, Texas where big oil and gas actually have to contribute more to the safety, environment, and infrastructure than they damage. I'm here to demand that the Color Oil and Gas Conservation Commission, you folks, get out of bed with big oil and gas, put your pants on, and get to work for the citizens of Colorado as you are tasked to do, and as it says at the top of your website, fostering the responsible development of Colorado's oil and gas natural resources in a matter consistent with the protection of public health, safety, and welfare, including the environment and wildlife resources.
Good morning. My name is Gary Norton. Uh, before I retired, I worked for many years as a right-of-way inspector for Denver Public Works Department. So very often when I think in everyday terms about what's going on here, what happens out in the real world as a result of this, I think of it as an inspector. I know a lot of what I did was just sort of standing in, making it look like things were going as they should be going on. But in fact, as an inspector, I simply served as a scarecrow, standing out on a construction site, giving the impression that if somebody wanted to honor the concerns of Denver citizens, taxpayers, whatever, that I was there uh, performing that nominal function. So apparently you guys have something in the range of 12 uh, inspectors for these 50,000 more than 55,000 wells, plus your inactive wells. And apparently you have something like five methane, moni methane monitoring devices that these guys share when they go out to look at wells. This results in inspections of maybe 10% of things once per year. Or then there's something called self-reporting, where the concerns themselves that we know are there to make money um, might once or twice or as much as four times per year report on how much methane is being lost. But now we know that if just 2.7% of the methane, which is the main ingredient of natural gas, uh, is lost from the time a drilling takes place through all the steps to where it's actually burned, um, and it's burned, um, you know, efficiently, that uh, that's a greater contributor to global warming gases than the burning of coal. So I, I think what you're engaged in here is just uh, like a totally hazardous sort of thing. Now, I also think that if you declared a moratorium and put in some monitoring kind of devices, stationary devices, scanning devices, something using drone technology, or since I'm sure some of you have trouble sleeping at night uh, overseeing this kind of thing, the type of thing that would be uh, mounted on uh, vehicles, and vehicles could range throughout these uh, drilling sites uh, at all hours of the day. Uh, this would represent a real approach to uh, seeing what it is we're doing to the environment uh, as we go on with this. Uh, and then as come back out of the moratorium, on a case-by-case -case basis when you see that your drillers have implemented this kind of technology. And don't just rely on them to collect the technology. Set up uh, ways of monitoring that so you and your staff and your employees can see what's going on in real time. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. I've been coming here just about every time you guys have your meetings. I'm sorry, could you just state your name for the record? Shana Oliver. Thank you. I'm going to reiterate everything. I am a survivor and descendant of the genocide that you guys call the long walk of the Navajo, which the beginning of the United States was the removal of the indigenous people of the land so that you could profit off of land that wasn't yours or real estate. Now oil and gas, the extraction of uh, other minerals that are used for nuclear weapons. All of these things contaminate the land and majority of these things are done out of sight, out of mind of the people that you, that use these resources. Like my reservation, the Navajo reservation, our lands are sacrificed for Las Vegas. Our water is sacrificed for Las Vegas. And our main rivers run through Colorado, which is the Colorado River, the San Juan River, the Rio Grande River, 
all those rivers go through our Navajo, our nation, and are also tied to our our sacred teachings. And you guys continue to neglect that by law, you're supposed to be addressing these things you're doing on indigenous lands with indigenous people. And I'm not talking about governments that are acting governments for the, for the false, the fraud of your United States government, which has been operating in fraud since 1933. And many of your representatives are aware of the fraud, but continue to be in bed with the corporations that make your jobs possible as well as stealing the tax monies from taxpayers to do your agendas against the people's will, funding illegal programs already around the world. Standing Rock was a shaking of the whole world as a wake up call for a transition. These talks you need to be thinking about transition because these wealthy people already bought their place to escape go. They already bought their $2 million underground condos for when everything goes to hell okay, above the ground. Ms. Oliver, excuse me. When will you guys listen to the up. people? Multiple scientists from these corporations have come out and said that what these oil and gas industries are saying me, is not true right and, and they are contaminating our lands, our water, and our air. So you need to actually follow through with the Martinez case and quit ignoring the people. Thank you, Ms. Oliver. Cody Walkup. Nishama Abraham Kramer Camp. Good morning. My name is Cody Walkup. I live in Watkins, Colorado. I came today because I wanted to talk about Conoco's Swan application in Arapahoe County. This is a bad location for many reasons, one of which is it's directly adjacent to the only ing ingress, egress to and from our community. Any kind of accident at the site could cut off the community from rescue attempts or potentially block residents from evacuating. But that's not why I came today. I came today to talk about the size and scope of the application as I believe it's intentionally misleading. Conoco originally submitted the Swan application to Arapahoe County in 2016 as a eight well, 32 tank site. At the time, this would have been the largest site and the closest site to a development in Arapahoe County. It was met with pushback from both the community and Arapahoe County. In fact, the application was pulled by Conoco after the county required a alternative site analysis. They have now resubmitted it as a one well application. However, it's clear to our community that Conoco has no intention of keeping it as a one well site for long. It seems evident to me the current application is Conoco's way of circumventing the rules regarding large multi-well sites this close to a community. Arapahoe County held a open house for our community earlier this month in connection with this application. At this open house, Maxwell Blair, a Conoco employee, mentioned to myself and other community members that more oil and gas, they have more oil and gas rights in this location and they fully intend to develop by drilling more wells. He stopped short of mentioning how many they plan to, to build or why they're only applying for one now, a year after they applied for eight in this location. Looking at the data on my handout, which came from all 2A forms on your guys' website, the Swan site contains 12.8 acres during construction and 12.2 after interim reclamation. This makes it very clear to me they plan on drilling many more wells than the one on their current application. The box on the left of my handout lists several Arapahoe County well sites that are comparable in size to the Swan project. As you can see, 11 plus acre sites generally have many more than one well, um, which is the current application of, this, of the Swan site. The box on the right consists of several oil and gas well sites with one well in Arapahoe County. The size of one well tends to be around five acres or less. This appears to confirm Mr. Blair's comment to me that this will be a multi-well production facility. I believe this should be treated as a multi-well site in the, um, for this application and not a one well site. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question of the staff? Commissioner Overturf. 
Is this a, um, my understanding is that the Swan site that we've now had a couple of public comments about is currently pending before commission staff as a 2A application, is that accurate? That's our understanding and we've reached out to staff to be able, available to you to answer questions kind of like in response to Boulder County's comments. Okay, thank you. Hello commissioners, my name is Nishama Abraham and I'm a 20 year resident of Boulder County. Thank you very much for your service. Um, I want to support the comments that I've heard first from um, Ms. Beach about forced pooling and other Colorado residents and from Ms. Williams from 350 and then most recently what Ms. Oliver said um, about the Martinez decision. So I want to talk about two things. One is the Martinez decision and the other is about Boulder County. Um, I'm specifically in opposition to the Crestone CDP final application. The commission has now a legal obligation to honor the Martinez decision. Until that decision is overturned, there is no lawful grounds to allow any permitting of oil and gas because it's very clear. We have plenty of evidence. Last time I came and spoke here, I cited 40 different studies that all have to do with public health and safety. And Boulder County specifically is opposed to any oil and gas development. Um, and I'm speaking now for tens of thousands of residents. I mean, this is now the anniversary of Rocky Flats. Rocky Flats brought over 100,000 citizens in opposition to that nuclear plant. Um, and it was a partnership. It was the citizens of Boulder County and, and Denver County, um, as well as the government. Now, it's the same in Boulder County. I mean, we will resist this. And I say this really for you all as commissioners, but also for any staff of Crestone or 8 North Extraction in this room. Boulder County is not fair game for any new oil and gas development. And <laughs> we have a deep love of our environment and we have intellectual capacity to understand the regulations. And we have financial resources, so we will fight. And, you know, legally, Boulder County residents, we've paid over $100 million to establish an open space program. It's very clear what that program allows. It allows for, chance for um, conservation, agriculture, and passive recreation. There is, oil and gas is not an allowable use on that land. So we have every legal right to fight against oil and gas, and we will do it. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Okay. Any questions from commissioners? Thank you for your time. Mr. Camp, Kramer Camp. Weston Wilson, Gina Hardin, or excuse me, Weston Wilson, Susan Permit, and then Gina Hardin. Elizabeth Owaskowitz, David Prowell. Excuse me, I, I'm Gina Hardin. Oh, okay. Go ahead, please. And so I just was waiting for the other two to show up. So I'm Jenna Harden. I'm from Denver. And um, so by now, you've hopefully read the multitude of studies indicating that there's no safe way to frack. You've heard the pleas of real people who have taken off time from work, who have driven here, who have uh, taken off time from their other responsibilities to beg you to consider the health and safety of their families and their communities. You're aware of the deaths. That sounds, when I say that, it always sounds like I'm being a bit hysterical. But we know there have been deaths, that's factual. So you know of the deaths and destruction and explosions that have occurred as a result of the oil and gas industry and the lack of oversight of it. You are aware of the thousands of leaks of toxic chemicals on our land and water. You're aware of the leaks of methane that are contributing a huge contributor to climate change. 
you have been told by the Colorado Supreme Court that the law demands that you consider health and safety first. On the other hand, you've heard from industry employees who are paid to come testify. I don't see industry, I don't see a lot of, of testimony here from people who are voluntarily taking off time to support oil and gas development in their neighborhoods. It's really not complicated. The golden rule says that you should do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Certainly that's a rule that all ethical people follow. Certainly we don't, have, it would be pretty indefensible to say do unto others what you would not have them do unto you. I don't think you would have your children and grandchildren suffer from asthma, leukemia, endocrinological problems, and the multitude of other health issues that people are experiencing. Most humans would not want to explain the, to their descendants that they chose the health of the oil and gas industry over the health of humans and other living things. Most humans would not want to leave a legacy of illness, environmental destruction, and death. Again, I beg of you to follow the simple rule that guides all ethical humans. Do unto others. And I don't know of any exceptions for the oil and gas industry. Thank you. Elizabeth Alaskowitz. Good morning. Uh, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Iwaskowitz. I have my PhD in Pharmacology and Neuroscience here from the University of Colorado Health Sciences Center. I am also a mom of a six-year-old. And I'm concerned about the proximity of fracking uh, near our homes and near our schools. Now, I have a six-year-old son. He attends Meadowlark School. That is the new school up in Erie. And I should mention, I am from Erie. I'm on the Boulder County side of Erie. So he attends the new Meadowlark School that is up there. And you'll recall that there was a large discussion at the time as far as whether that school would even be built, given the proximity of what I think is an abandoned, currently abandoned well uh, that is within 500 feet of that school. And my understanding is that Anadarko intends to redrill that, and they have not submitted an application for that yet. So for that reason, I had a blood uh, volatile organics uh, compound test run on my son to be able to establish baseline levels of exposure of any of these chemicals before they begin drilling at this site. So I walk the line between a scientist and a mom, and I'm trying to make sure that I can make well-informed and, and good decisions, both for my family as well as for our community. So I had a uh, blood VOC test done. It was run by Genova Diagnostics. They are a CLIA uh, certified uh, laboratory, so that means they are certified to run clinical diagnostic tests. And they are one of the few labs in the nation that is able to run this test. And I do understand that there is an ambient exposure that all of us experience from VOCs. This comes from smoking, both firsthand or secondhand smoking. It also comes from fuel stations, lawnmowers, Okay, I understand that there is a background level of exposure that, that we might all um, be exposed to and, and certainly have some exposure levels to. What I was unprepared, though, to see was how high these levels already were in my six-year-old son. For benzene levels, he is in the 79th percentile for exposure, and this is based on the NHANES data that comes from 2009, part of the CDC. He is the 85th percentile for ethyl benzene. He is the 72nd percentile for MNP benzene, or MNP xylene, and the 81st percentile for oxylene. 
In discussing this with my community, we've also found that there are several others who have also had these blood tests run, and there are several other parents that are certainly looking to have these done as well. I have another four-year-old test. He is in the 90th percentile for benzene. So what I ask you is, if these elevated levels in my six-year-old son are not a result of the 158 wells that are within a one-mile radius of my home and his school, ma'am, I'm sorry, you're where are up. these coming from? 158. 72 of them are still <laughs> producing. The others are currently uh, shut in, but I think still listed as an active field. These are high levels. If it's not from the fracking, then where? Thank you for your time. David Prowell. I apologize for mispronouncing last names. I've got them going on to our signups today. Um, Mary Fonstock and Bernadette Fonstock. There's also a Margaret Fonstock. John Yelenek, Jean Landry, and Larry Moore. If, if I called your name, would you raise your hand? Or we got some people standing. Oh, okay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Yelnick, and I've been participating in the cleanup for the Rocky Mountain Arsenal for 25 years as a, as a volunteer. I was elected chairman of the Restoration Advisory Board by my peers, which is the board that reports to the U.S. Army. Likewise, I'm also elected by my peers to represent the site-specific advisory board for the U.S. EPA. What you see behind me is a map that was created by the U.S. Army when we commenced negotiations for the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Its applicability has to do with the petrol operating request to frack in the middle of this pathway. That blue pathway is something called diisopropyl methylphosphonate. If you take GB sarin and you pull off the fluoride molecule, you're going to get DIMP is the acronym. DIMP reformates in the presence of chloroform or fluoride back into GB sarin. This map here is 0.392 parts per billion. The Chemical Weapons Treaty specifically says zero should be released into the environment. Negotiations at that time with Attorney General Gail Norton preempted the application of the treaty, trying to use states' rights as the justification. She subsequently joined Shell Oil on their board of directors. This plume also contains some 600 other compounds that are continually migrating off the Rocky Mountain Arsenal. We have two records of decision that were agreed to during our negotiations, specifically setting forth reliance upon the subsurface characterizations of that migration pathway. To frack this subsurface area, which is being requested in section 10 and 11, is dead center in the middle of that migration pathway. On top of that, we have extensive history of movement of that subsurface based upon injection, which resulted in the movement and the creation of new pathways, specifically earth tremors. My concern 
is not only are we going to, if we approve this request, undermine 25 years of work characterizing that subsurface, potentially creating new pathways, which goes possibly to the surface, upon which we have a little over $1.2 billion of residential development. Many of these individuals have no idea that they're living on a Superfund site uniquely created by a violation of the Chemical Weapons Treaty Organization. Pursuant to your Rule 503, I have now learned that no notice was given to the operators of the facility known as the Rocky Mountain Arsenal, including the U.S. Army, Shell Oil, U.S. EPA, and the Department of the Interior. That leaves me with the sole request that this application either be postponed until we have specific responses from the United States government relative to this request. Thank you. Director Murphy, would you care to comment on that? We are not quite prepared to, but we will be prepared to shortly. Thank you. Larry Moore, Jordan Carroll, Micah Parkin, Margaret Furr. Good morning. My name is Dr. Larry Moore. I'm a resident of El Paso County and Manitou Springs. I'm a retired emergency medicine physician, and I'm here speaking for my grandchildren. And Dr. Wolk, I'm particularly delighted you're here to hear my testimony this morning. I want to talk about the research that Dr. Lisa McKenzie has just released the first part of April, another study. Dr. Lisa McKenzie is a researcher at the uh, Colorado School of Public Health, the Anschutz, Anschutz Medical Campus. And this was a study that looked at uh, air monitoring adjacent or near to oil and gas extraction. The number 500 should stick in your mind uh, because her research was done for people that were living within uh, 500 feet of oil and gas production. I want to remind you that at 501 feet, it doesn't stop. It just tapers off out to about 10 miles. So her research found this, this study, this most recent study, and, and Dr. McKenzie has done two previous studies that I'll reference in just a moment, uh, that for the lifetime cancer risk for those living within 500 feet of active oil and gas uh, production was eight times higher than what EPA says. EPA says zero because benzene is a very hazardous uh, environmental toxin. The study focused on the emissions of non-methane hydrocarbons. There are four that we talk about. They're BTEC. They're called benzene, which you've heard about, toluene, ethylbenzene, and xylene, and they're all considered very hazardous. And uh, I referenced the previous speaker who talks about her six-year-old. I have grandchildren who don't happen to live near oil and gas extraction, but I'm speaking for all the grandchildren that do. And we have a serious issue in terms of our setback interpretation for schools now. You know, kids go to school and they don't stay in the school building, they stay on the property. So a setback that talks about setback from the corner of the school building is inappropriate. It needs to be set back from the property because that's where kids go to school. They go to school on the property and they're there at least six hours a day. So for those people living within, this is back to Dr. McKenzie's study now, those people living within uh, 500 feet of uh, oil and gas extraction, um, there was an 8.3 per 10,000 population cancer risk estimated. And the EPA says the cancer risk should be not more than one. So eight times what EPA says. We now know that along the front range, oil and gas extraction has moved into neighborhoods so that there are about 350,000 people living within one mile from active oil and gas extraction. So I will tell you that I think the study is valid. I think Dr. McKenzie's a valid researcher. This has been published. This has been peer reviewed. I think we need to pay attention to the science. I think you all need to pay attention to the science. I, some of you have children. Some of you have grandchildren. They're going to inherit what we're doing today, and I think we need to be more sensible about what we have to decide. Thank you. Jordan Carroll, Micah Parkin, 
Hello, my name is Micah Park, and I'm speaking today as a mother and as executive director of 350 Colorado. We, pre we represent 14,000 members in Colorado who are calling for a safe, just, and healthy future for our children and future generations. I participated in a fracking tour that our 350 team organized this past Saturday in Weld County. And in just, two hour, in just a two-hour tour, the emissions made me so horribly dizzy and ill, I had to go home and sleep for three hours and felt horrible for the rest of the day. No one should have to live near these toxic sites. I encourage you to go on the next fracking tour that we organize and see for yourselves. We're disappointed that even with the new leadership of Director Julie Murphy, the COGCC has still not dropped the appeal of the Martinez court decision that directed the COGCC to prioritize public health and safety as a precondition to permitting oil and gas development. Regardless, this decision is the standing rule of law, and it should be treated as such. Once again, we demand that the COGCC place a moratorium on further permitting until independent studies can prove that the COGCC is using best available science to regulate the oil and gas industry in a manner truly protective of public health and safety, and until it is properly funded to do so, and not through general funds, which takes money from our schools, police, and firefighters. Public health studies show increased cancer and other serious health effects to those living within a half mile of oil and gas development, and yet the COGCC has continued to approve wells only 500 feet from homes, 1,000 feet from school buildings, and right by playgrounds and ball fields. The COGCC is currently out of line with current law, out of line with public health studies, out of line with our climate science that indicates that we should not be fostering any oil and gas development with our planet overheating, and the COGCC is out of line with public opinion. In a re recent po poll, 69% of voters statewide and across the political spectrum support increasing setbacks between oil and gas development and home schools, playgrounds, and water sources to 2,500 feet, which aligns with health studies showing increased cancer, asthma, birth defects, low birth weight babies at closer distances. 2,500 feet, nearly a half mile, is also the distance that's frequently evacuated when there are fires and explosions at oil and gas sites. And there have been 15 such fires and explosions since the Firestone explosion last year that killed two men, severely burned a woman and teacher and injured a child. It has been and continues to be the responsibility of this body to protect public health, safety, and welfare, but it continues to fail the people of Colorado. So Colorado is rising up to protect ourselves. We encourage everyone listening to go to corising.org, corising.org, to find out where to sign the Colorado Rising Ballot Initiative petitions for 2,500-foot safety zones and to volunteer to collect signatures so that we can take this before voters this November. Commissioners, regardless of politics, you have an ethical responsibility to protect the public health and safety of your fellow Coloradans above promotion of one irresponsible fossil industry. Drop the appeal of the Martinez decision. Put health and safety first. Enact an, an, an emergency moratorium now. Margaret Furr. Good morning. I am a Franciscan nun, Sister Elizabeth Furr. The contemplative Franciscan sisters, the poor Claires of Denver, are losing their solitude and way of life because of the development in Denver. They were going to move to the Eastern Plains, I believe, near Watkins, but because of the fracking there, they could not find solitude or beauty or safety for their way of life. Our democracy is being undermined by guidelines set by oil and gas. Democracy must be safeguarded. Thank you. James Parrott, Joel Fulcher, Joby Rittenhouse. Any of you in the room today? Ms. Prime, that concludes the online sign up or online and sign up this morning. Um, are you aware of anything else? I believe I signed up, but my name was never called. Okay. I apologize. If, if uh, Tyra, do you want, Mr. Chair, do you want to allow people who are here to? And what was your name, ma'am? Susan Johnson. Um, Sure, why don't you come up and give your comments? Before, I'm sorry, oh. before we get started, if you could just raise your hand if you haven't commented and you would like to comment. 
Okay. Thank you. Am I okay to? Yes. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Susan Donka, and I'm here representing the rest of the community out in Watkins, um, outside of Watkins Farms. We've got an additional 80 plus homes that are literally jammed into that corner um, with one ingress and egress. All of the oil and gas development in this area totally undermines any kind of um, safety that we may have. Any kind of emergency issue that arises in that area with one road to get in and out of this area um, is beyond irresponsible. This SWAN site that they're proposing, that ConocoPhillips and the COGCC is proposing with their current permit, um, without any kind of um, look at an alternative site, which we have numerous, if you guys look at that area, is beyond irresponsible. The health and safety of this community lies on your guys' shoulders. And what we've been seeing is you don't care. Um, I have two small children and we have oil and gas literally surrounding us. And the thought that these chemicals that are emitted by these oil and gas operations um, scares me to death. And it should scare you to death. Thank you. Ma'am, I'm sorry. Would you spell your last name for me so I can put you on the list? D-A-H-N-C-K. Thank you. Ma'am, please go ahead. My name is Gayla Martinez, and my name should be on the list. I came to this meeting last month and went home wondering how and why this commission continues to approve application after application on behalf of oil and gas when there is so much anguished public opposition. So I took the time to listen to the audio recording of the entire March 19th meeting. It was very revealing. The first thing I learned is that you folks are overwhelmed. You have a backlog of work that dictates a rapid fire approach to every application that comes your way. You'd like to have more discussion about some of the issues people have brought before you, but there's just no time. At this point, I waited for one of you to suggest a moratorium, but no one did. The second thing I heard was concern over regulations that determine the buffer zone between drilling operations and school property. That's good news, I thought. Perhaps someone will suggest a halt to the kind of assaults on our children like we've seen at Bella Romero Academy in Greeley. But then Ms. Murphy said that schools and oil and gas should, quote, be planning for co-development. That had the same sound as the cat swallowing the bird after declaring that cats and birds should be planning for cohabitation. I learned that forced pooling is another nagging concern. No one was quite sure what the law would allow the board to do, and everyone was interested in how other states are handling the problem. Might it be best to stop forced pooling until we have a better idea of what we're doing? There was the admission that underfunded companies which have been served fines can refuse to pay those fines, virtually holding the state hostage by threatening to leave with all the cleanup costs going to Colorado taxpayers. The amount of money held in bond for these purposes is entirely inadequate. Legislators, courts, and the COGC keep tossing this hot potato back and forth with no one wanting to take responsibility. Another good reason, to halt further permitting until the issue can be resolved. Then there's the, the problem of venting, which is increasing in part because of inadequate infrastructure. So much oil and gas is being produced that the pipelines and the midstream processors can't keep up. An inordinate amount of gas is being burned off, wasted. Filling the air with more and more methane, which as Mr. LaPlante from the CDPHE pointed out, is contributing significantly to the non-compliant status of air quality along most of the Front Range. At this point, I was sure that someone on the commission would make a motion for a moratorium, or at least a slowdown. Something to protect the people and the environment of Colorado from the runaway train of oil and gas development 
that is hurtling through the state at a rate far too fast to be properly controlled. It's not just product that's being wasted. It's our health, our future economy, our irreplaceable environment, the very things you have been tasked with protecting. If you haven't been given enough resources to do the job right, then stop handing out new permits until you can. To do otherwise is to act with inexcusable negligence and irresponsibility. Thank you. Yes, ma'am, please. I came in with my walker this morning, which was very cumbersome, and they let me in early. And I was the first one to sign the list back there, so I don't know why I didn't get called. Um, I apologize. My name is Jennifer. My name is Jennifer Moore, and I live in Glenwood Springs. I left home at 4:30 this morning to get down here, and I'm speaking on behalf of of Garfield County. Um, let's see. I, I lived in the Denver area for 17 years, starting in 1976, and moved up to Garfield County in 1993. So I've been around all this a long time, and I've watched changes. Um, I'm extremely concerned about the greed, the carelessness, the cavalier attitude of the oil and gas industry, and in all honesty, this commission, because you're not, you know, you sit here and you listen, but you don't do anything. Um, this is a public health issue. It's a safety issue. The lack of integrity to actually follow the regulations in this state, which your expensive oil and gas companies, expensive propaganda TV commercials, I could throw bricks at the TV every time I see one because about half of what they're saying is flat out lies. Um, in the summer of 2016, um, a whistleblower um, pointed out that in Garfield County, out of all the wells that have been drilled in the last 10 years, only four in 10 had ever even seen an inspector during the whole course of the well. And um, I'm a public land owner, and I care about the quality of the air I breathe, the water I drink, all of the issues of oil and gas drilling affecting our groundwater, our creeks, our rivers, and our watersheds long term. I am also concerned about wildlife habitat and protecting our public lands, national parks and monuments. I also vote. And we're going to probably have some turnover in the state legislature because we want, we're tired of this. We want people to listen and pay attention. And um, the COGCC has never not approved a drilling permit of any kind that I've ever known of. And I've been paying attention. Uh, I'm here today to stop the greed, the payoffs to our legislature, whatever's going on that nobody's listening to us. Um, I'm tired of having our, our, our voices squelched. And I appreciate this. I'm sorry this is handwritten. My computer crashed out on me. I would like to turn this in, please. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anyone else in the audience that would like to make a comment today? I'd like to. I, I don't want to say anything, but I will. <laughs> I've said it over and over again. If, if there's an echo in this room, it's me telling you that you have to observe Martinez because it's the law of the state. My name is Philip Doe. I live in Littleton. But one thing that's really irritating is that there is never a response from you people. Now, a format like this becomes aggravating after a while, and it's really aggravating now because the severance tax doesn't cover your operation. We, the taxpayers, are covering this shoddy operation. You have to dignify these people's concern with some response. I have been down here at least 10 times. Never once have you ever said anything to these people's legitimate concerns. Now they have to pay. Now they have to pay for it. They don't realize that, but the, your budget is coming out of the general fund because the severance tax 
isn't adequate to cover your operation. If most people knew that, they would close you down if they had the opportunity. But please, if you're going to take their money, now and then act in their, on their behalf. You haven't up to this point. And it's coming to the breaking point. It really is. Thank you. Anybody else who wants to make public comment? I'm sorry, sir. You. Uh, I got a different subject. Can I make a comment on that too? Uh, sir, keep it brief. It'll be brief. <laughs> uh, since you already know that uh, oil companies drilling wells on our farm, uh, the flow lines that go from the wellheads to the tank battery, uh, the oil company has told us that the, the amount of topsoil that they need to remove uh, to make us happy, and it came from the Oil and Gas Commission rules is what they told us. It was only six to eight inches. And our farm over the years, I mean, my dad bought it from the guy that homesteaded it. And being a farmer, I'd like to have all my topsoil. So our topsoil is about 10 to 12 inches. And uh, I would like to see some kind of rule, if you guys have the rule that for the six to eight inches, uh, the rule I'd like to see is that the oil companies need to go to the United States Department of Agriculture and get one of their soil people to come out and actually determine what the topsoil is on the specific piece of property that they're working on so the farmer can have all of his topsoil if he wants it back. That's the other subject. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Director Murphy. Chairman, I wanted to bring to the Commission's attention um, two items that, well, staff has received about 75 comments from Lakewood High School students, and we will be making those available to the Commissioners. Um, as well, over the weekend, I believe, or at least in the last 24 hours, we've received numerous, i.e. 150 or more, letters about fracking that I will also make available to the Commissioners. So I wanted to just let you all know that they're coming. Thank you, Director. Um, okay, well then that concludes the public comment portion of the meeting, uh, of the hearing. Um, we've got the report from the Executive Director. Um, don't know if, how long you plan to speak, whether we should break now or... But, if you're not going to speak brief, long, let's no, go ahead with it. Sure. Shall I? Yes, please. Great. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm Bob Randall, the Executive Director of the Department of Natural Resources. Um, I'll report on a couple of legislative items and then a couple of things in the water world, and then I'm happy to take questions from any commissioners. Um, so as for legislation, um, we are down to the final couple of weeks of the session. Um, most of the department bills have run their course um, successfully, including the Parks and Wildlife Future Generations Bill, which will increase hunting and fishing license fees, build an a, a a inflationary factor um, and ensure that our spending power keeps up with inflation. Um, it hasn't yet been signed, but it's passed both houses, so we're really happy about that. Um, the lottery reauthorization bill passed as well. That um, funds, among other things, Great Outdoors Colorado, of which depart the department is a beneficiary as well as the rest of Coloradans through um, parks, open space, conservation easement grants, and things like that. Um, House Bill 1008 was signed just last week. That's the Aquatic Nuisance Species Bill. This creates a new boat registration fee to fund the um, inspection and decontamination program for aquatic nuisance species. These are zebra or quagga mussels that once, once in Colorado waterways could destroy water infrastructure. Um, we are one of um, a very few headwater states um, that are muscle free, as we like to say. Um, and this bill will help ensure that we have the funding to continue that. Um, as for board appointments and confirmations, this I know is, is a personal subject for a few of us here. Um, 
most but not all of our confirmations have moved through the Senate. Um, we had six new members of the Water Conservation Board confirmed last week. In addition, um, Parks and Wildlife had a confirmation hearing on Thursday. We anticipate having the two commissioners here um, before the Senate, uh, before the end of the session. So please bear with us and, and um, stay tuned on that. A couple of things just quickly on water. Um, first, you know, a subject that's been in the media a lot lately has been um, snowpack and drought as we get into the spring and summer. Um, this is something that we monitor regularly through the Water Availability Task Force that's chaired by two divisions within DNR, um, includes folks from CSU, from CU, from the federal government, NOAA, and NRCS. Um, and what we've seen is that several of the drought indices have been met. Um, extreme drought covers 21% of the state, severe drought covers 29%, and moderate drought covers 16%. And while I can't explain the difference necessarily between extreme, severe, and moderate, suffice it to say that very much of the state is experiencing drought conditions. Um, we've seen a loss of winter wheat in the ag community, and strong winds have already fueled some early spring fires. Um, as of April 19th, so this, this is a week or so old, statewide snowpack was at 69% of average. Um, and down in the Rio Grande and the southwest, southwest basins, they've already seen 50% of their snowpack melt off due to an early spring. So um, these are, again, conditions that we monitor pretty closely. We watch reservoir storage levels that water providers keep. Um, and so the drought conditions are somewhat tempered by the fact that statewide reservoir storage is well over 100%. We're at 114% of normal storage. And all of our basins are above average as far as reservoirs go. Um, but we have been discussing with the governor the activation of the state's drought mitigation and response plan, which calls for an interagency body to get together and to coordinate um, to identify potential impacts from drought and, and have structures in place so that we can quickly um, address those. That's a plan that's approved by FEMA. It, again, includes folks from Departments of Agriculture and Commerce at NOAA. Um, so stay tuned on that. Um, Second, second water matter I'll report on is just some controversy that was in the, in the press in the last week or so on the Colorado River. So um, river management on the Colorado is, is done through what's called the Law of the River. That is a complicated series of, of federal laws, um, an interstate compact between the upper basin and the lower basin states, treaties, and case law. Um, so it's complicated, and we had some rare fireworks in that in the last week. Um, and just by virtue of them being rare, it's noteworthy, but it's also a pretty big deal. Um, so management on the Colorado was achieved by um, the levels between the upper basin and the lower basin states um, is achieved through management of Lake Powell and Lake Mead. Um, and if Lake Mead drops too low, then Lake Powell is required to send more water to the lower basin states, basically under the compact and the law of the river. Um, in the last two weeks, the upper basin states and Denver Water accused the Central Arizona Project or the Central Arizona Water Cons Conservancy District of manipulating their water orders to keep Lake Mead from dipping to a level where shortage would be declared and they would have to curtail, but keeping it low enough that more, more water was required to be delivered from Lake Powell. And they identified this as the sweet spot. Um, and so again, this is what passes for high drama in the Colorado River. Um, and interstate water management. Um, and on that, I'm, I'm kind of kidding, but the stakes really are very high. Uh, the river supplies water to 40 million people in the U.S., um, includes the driest reaches in the most populated areas of the West. Um, and the accusation isn't that the Central Arizona Project is breaking the rules or breaking the law, but rather that they're um, being sneaky and manipulative. Um, and that, in that world, is not okay. So um, all of our interstate water team is meeting in Salt Lake City this week with other representatives from upper basin states and lower basin states to work with Arizona to sort of bring them back into the fold um, and ensure that um, management of Colorado River resources are, are, are done in a fair way. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions on those matters or any others. Um, and otherwise, I'll, I'll pass it on. Commissioners, any questions? Commissioner Overture? I think Commissioner Jolly had his hand up first. Oh, sorry. Thank Commissioner you. Jolly. What uh, goes into the drought plan? What, what, I mean, what, what can the state do about the drought well, so, to, to um, mitigate the impacts? So the, 
So the drought plan really functions to bring people together to be able to share information in a way that's you know responsible and responsive, and they can act quickly. Um, you know, the drought plan includes a, f a handful of, of drought impact impact task forces. Um, we're looking at activating the agricultural impact task force, um, and so that would be a group that could get together and agree on conditions and facilitate um, grants from USDA's NRCS, for example, um, and ensuring that um, ag producers who are experiencing drought get the resources that they need to deal with it. Um, it can also include coordinating with the Small Business Administration. Um, if criteria are met through the Drought Task Force, they can forward recommendations onto the Small Business Association in order to facilitate um, grants or low-interest loans in order to just mitigate the impacts that, that businesses have, have felt from the drought. It doesn't call for, um, it's not a water management document, if that's maybe what you're asking. It doesn't say water providers should um, put on restrictions. It doesn't say, um, you know, it doesn't call out certain water rights or anything like that. It's really just about um, identifying impacts and, and coordinating them closely to serve the people that are impacted. Thank you. Yep. Sir, did you want to make a comment? I had a question. If this is a public hearing, may I ask a question of the gentleman? Yes, sir. Go ahead. So I've heard that uh, the fracking operation takes water out of the general hy hydraulic cycle and uh, puts it so far underground that it's no longer um, even part of that cycle. The West generally is an arid part of the United States. Do you have comments or feelings or uh, ideas to uh, to express in that regard, especially to the commission? Sure. Um, I'll address that quickly. Um, and, sir, I might want to follow up with you just because I don't have the resources at my fingertips to be able to quote exact numbers. Um, this is a matter that the Division of Water Resources, which is within the Department of Natural Resources, looked at a couple of years ago. That they're also known as the State Engineer's Office, if you, if you ever see that referenced. Um, they administer water rights around the state. They have a really good sense of um, how much water is allocated to certain uses in the state. Um, you know, 80% roughly is for agriculture. Somewhere under 10% is used for municipal and industrial, um, other uses and things like that. So again, I can get some of that, those figures to you. What we saw from them, and this again was probably over a year old, um, but looking at the quantities that are you, the quantities of water that are used for hydraulic fracturing in a typical well, multiplied by the number of anticipated wells, um, came to a number that was less than one percent of the state's water uses. Um, and again, I, I, I'm reluctant to put numbers to it because I don't want to get it wrong. But I can tell you that this is something that they've looked at. If you want to. Um, either pass me your contact information or we can visit on a break. Um, I'd be happy to get you their analysis. But again, it, it, it came to a, a, a large amount when you turn it into gallons, but a small amount compared to the rest of the consumptive uses of water in the state. So I'd love to follow up with you. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner Randall. The other comment I would make is that some of the water is recycled and reused, treated and reused. Not all of it, but some of it. Um, Fair point. Commissioner Randall. Um, do you have any, any other May I ask Commissioner Overturf? Certainly. Um, at, the, at the mill levy rulemaking that we conducted a few months ago, there was a significant discussion about pending legislation that would have, well, let me back up. There was significant discussion amongst the commissioners about increasing the mill levy above the recommendation of staff in order to address some issues that we've seen arise with orphan wells. And my understanding was that we were, um, there was legislation pending and we didn't want to take any action because we wanted to kind of see what happened at the legislature. So I wonder what the status of that is and whether it is, is still alive. Great. Commissioner Randall. You bet. Um, so a couple of things. Um, one, we had been talking internally and with stakeholders about let, whether legislation was needed to facilitate the plugging and abandonment of orphan wells generally, aside from the funding questions. Um, do we have the resources, do we have the legal tools at our disposal to either do it ourselves or to have someone else do that work um, in a way that they could, um, you know, ensure that they're not held responsible they're not, so that they wouldn't attach long-term liability and things like that. Um, we've determined that that legislation isn't necessary. 
Um, as to the funding side, um, you know, while we as a commission have the authority statutorily to increase the mill um, by an additional 0. 0.6 mills, I always get the I always get the denominator wrong there, but you know what I mean. We can, we're at 1.1, we can go to 1.7 under statute. Um, we don't have the spending authority in the existing budget. The, the prow line, the plug and plugging and reclamation line, again, I'm getting acronyms <coughs> wrong, um, is set at $445,000 and has been for a long time. And so that's the money that we've been using to, to plug wells. Um, this year, included in the budget in the long bill, um, was a provision that would increase the commission spending authority up to $5 million to in that line, the prowl line. Um, it didn't come with any money to do that. Again, that's something that this commission could consider doing in the future to raise the mill to generate revenue to fill that um, at some level. Um, but it did ensure that we had the tool at our disposal um, should we determine that's necessary, should we through rulemaking to determine that it's appropriate, um, increase the mill to generate revenue to do that work. So I'm glad you asked about that. I should have included that in my legislative update. Yep. Thank you, Commissioner Randall. Commissioner Hawkins. Um, at the last hearing, I asked questions about um, potentially looking at our pooling statute, our pooling rules, and um, also about uh, setbacks from school boundaries, and I heard that there were probably going to be some uh, legislative issues that might address that. Could you give us a little update on where that is? And I can, and I suspect that Director Murphy is going to address some of that in her director's report, too. Um, first, on the pooling question, there was a bill that I think has passed. Did it pass the House? It passed the House committee. So there have been pieces of legislation. Um, in each house um, to address pooling. Um, we provided testimony to say that these things are workable. Um, we didn't take a position on them, or is that just on one of them? Again, I'm getting into the details that I haven't been as involved with. Um, and that we had hoped that the parties could meet and work out a compromise, you know, work out a bill that does what they're both seeking to accomplish. And again, I might let Director Murphy address that during her director's report um, as well. Um, and then I think she's going to provide an update on the school setback issue as well. Perfect. Thank you. Any other commissioners? Thank you, All Commissioner right. Randall. Thank you. Um, I'm going to suggest that we move forward with your report unless it's going to be lengthy. Um, I don't think it will be lengthy, and I'll try to keep it as brief um, because. As I can. Just to continue for a moment, I, I, um, we're a little bit ahead of schedule, and I'd like to capitalize on that. We've got two lengthy, potentially lengthy matters this afternoon. So if we can move up the schedule a little bit, I know that Mr. Feuerstein is here, Ms. Jost is here. Um, the, the agenda for the afternoon calls for your matter to come up at 145. Chairman, may we approach? Would, would you um, be, uh, can, yeah, would you Chair? be able to move that up just a bit? Can I take that head on briefly? Sure. Um, Director Murphy. Thank you. And maybe I'll do this in lieu of my re report right now, but it was going to be an appendage to it. So um, we received word from the parties, uh, Mr. Feuerstein and Ms. Jost, late Friday, that their clients had negotiated um, a letter agreement that would lead to settlement of this matter and requested a continuance. Um, <coughs> and so that whether to continue it is something that is kind of the first item for you all to consider. And if you wanted to take that up now, that would be fine. I have a joint motion um, that I can provide to you um, from the parties as well. So they have asked that we bring this forward as quickly as possible. I was hesitant to do that before public comment because I think sticking with our public comment process is a priority right now. Um, but if you wanted to take that up now, I can hold my report until after our break. But it would result in continuing this matter to June. Where do I sign? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Boygan. And uh, Commissioner Boygan and the rest of the commission, we appreciate the opportunity to come before you and uh, uh, request uh, the uh, hearing examiner's reconsideration of our. I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Davenport. Yes. 
I, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, um, I just want to, before we jump in to the motion, I want to make sure it's clear on the record what matters we're talking about. And so if um, I know that uh, Mr. Rouse would normally set this up for us, Ms. Prime, would you like me to do that? Would you, would, whatever you'd like to do, but I just want to clarify what we're talking about before we start talking about it. We've got a neophyte chairman here who's not totally up on protocol. The matter is docket number 18060395 Watkins Road, um, protested by Burlington Resources. That matter was supposed to appear before you at 145 this afternoon. Thank you, Ms. Prime. Mr. Davenport, is that sufficient? Okay, thank you, Mr. Feuerstein. Yes, uh, to continue, um, our, uh, the, the parties met on Thursday. We actually, uh, to, set, to set a little bit more background, we had our pre-hearing conference with Mr. Rouse on Monday, a week ago today. Uh, we advised him at that, point, at that time that we were meeting on Thursday to, to uh, discuss settlement of the issue, and he encouraged us to move forward with uh, settlement discussions, which, in fact, we did. On Thursday, we reached an agreement in principle that was papered by Ms. Jost and I on Friday, and uh, at, uh, in mid-afternoon on Friday, we requested the hearing examiner to continue. Par part of the uh, agreement requ uh, requires that we jointly ask ask for a continuance until the next available uh, hearing, which would, the next scheduled hearing, which was June 11th. Uh, and the reason for that is we have metrics built into our le initial letter agreement to provide for uh, negotiating definitive surface use agreements and also pipeline easements between now and then, because we're dealing with uh, potentially three surface use agreements and another two or three easement agreements. And so we have set, uh, we, we have set our conclusion date uh, for entering the definitive agreements on the 30th uh, and had requested the continuance of this, our, our hearing today to uh, June 11th to uh, accommodate us entering into the definitive agreements. Although we do have a, what we call a framework agreement, what I called a framework agreement or an initial agreement. So mid-afternoon, uh, Ms. Jost, uh, I was, I was uh, at a memorial service, so Ms. Jost sent a joint request to hearing examiner um, uh, Rouse in order to continue, and uh, we were very surprised to see a denial come back uh, via email. And so we got together on Saturday and prepared a paper motion to, to have the full commission reconsider uh, the denial of our request for a continuance. And so that's why we're here. And, and you have the, the, uh, the, the written motion before you now. Thank you, Mr. Fierce. And I should have said before you started talking that it was my intention to recuse myself from this matter um, I th still think it's appropriate for me to do that, although we're not addressing the merits, simply the issue of continuance. So, um, not sure, Ms. Jost, how, what's your reaction to that? Because I'm prepared to recuse myself. Hey, thank you, Chair. Um, I guess we would request specifically that you do recuse yourself from this vote specifically because um, it does tie to a matter that you would have otherwise recused yourself for no other reason than that. And thank you for the option to, to Understood. chat Understood. So I will recuse myself from any consideration, and I'm not sure I should even chair this part of the hearing. So perhaps, um, Commissioner, <laughs> I'm sorry? Deep on the bench. <laughs> so, um, if it ever what, gets to me, we're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> what would be the protocol for a substitute chair for this purpose? Well, let's see. You've uh, recused yourself, and so we would need, I think, um, normally that would be Commissioner Holton as the co vice chair, but uh, I think it would be more appropriate in this case to have a, a member of the commission who's actually present in person, and so um, maybe you can request. Commissioner Holton. I don't have a problem with Commissioner Boykin running the meeting. Well, the system told him to hire him, but I just want to be discussed. One side or the other. Uh, Commissioner Holton, thank you for the suggestion. I'm going to respectfully um, decline it and, and recuse myself. Um, so um, 
I think you can ask for if there's a volunteer. For a volunteer. <laughs> Anyone to care chair to chair this, this part of the hearing? <laughs> Commissioner Randall, I see you at least <laughs> gesticulating. I don't know if that's a <laughs> don't call, don't call on me or no. I'm I'd be happy to chair the consideration of the joint motion for reconsideration of the hearing officer's decision on the motion to continue. Okay, Commissioner Randall, it's all yours. Okay. Do I need to be sworn in? No. <laughs> um, okay. Um, just to be clear, I, I think uh, since you are provisionally the acting chair, would um, I think it might be appropriate to ask if anybody, if any commissioner has an objection to your serving as chair before we proceed any further? No. 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 Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Seeing none, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Um, and again, I'm a neophyte chair too. I mean, I do think it's maybe worth hearing from the parties um, to the matter as to their, you know, just to explain the grounds for their motion, um, their joint motion to continue, and then maybe to hear from staff as to their rationale for um, denying it, and then we can consider that and I th think I'd like to keep this pretty brief so if, if we could have um, three minutes jointly from the parties if you're able to is that sufficient yes thank you new chair for our hearing <laughs> Um, I think actually we can keep this very brief. I mean, Mr. Fierstein um, very well set forth the background facts for this. And as he stated, we were quite surprised when we received a denial of this continuance. Um, and I guess for purposes of proper procedures, we did file this joint motion for reconsideration of the hearing officer's decision in order to get it in front of you today. Um, really, our rationale um, is located in section B7 of our motion. And again, this comes down to the fact that we believe that the denial is against the commission staff's prior precedent of continuing matters, regardless of when the request comes in, when joint continuances are sought, especially when the commission staff already has an overburdened workload, and this joint continuance comes on behalf of a surface owner operator dispute, not an operator operator dispute. Um, this actually goes against the Commission's own statements to parties in contested matters, providing that such parties should attempt all avenues of resolution prior to bringing contested matters to the Commission for decision. The third piece is that this would be against, to have the hearing today, would be against the private contract terms of WRA and Burlington's written agreement. Um, we would have the, we also have the Colorado Rules of Professional Conduct Rule 1.2, which requires us as their counsel to abide by a client's decision concerning the objectives of the representation and shall consult with the clients as to the means by which those are to be pursued. Part of the, the letter agreement, as Mr. Fierstein discussed, was continuing this for a month, so the parties do have the ability to continue the definitive agreements as agreed to by May 30th um, as part of the letter agreement. And, and frankly, the last part is that the denial truly fairly criticized the parties for seeking an expedited hearing even though the Commission's own rules, specifically Rule 305E2, which this expedited hearing was set forth on, expressly mandates that an expedited hearing be suspended or on suspended APDs be set. So we were engaging with the Commission staff on their own rules. Um, really, again, we would hope that we would get a continuance of this matter to allow the parties to continue to work their definitive agreements and proceed um, in July or June, I'm sorry, if needed. Again, we have a May 30th, 2018 date for execution of those definitive agreements. Um, I think we would jointly agree to if there would be a continuance, we could seek a date certain with the staff to ensure that that would be put forth so it did not happen Friday before a Monday scheduled hearing. Thank you. Uh, I don't have anything else to add uh, other than what you heard from my uh, opening remarks. Great. Thank you. Any questions for the parties? Okay, I think I'd like to hear from um, Hearing Officer Rouse, if you could uh, approach. Thank you, Commissioner Randall. <coughs> are, are you Commissioner Randall or Vice Chair today? Or? Uh, <laughs> acting Chair. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, 
Unfortunately, since we don't seem to be broadcasting, I did not hear the first part of the comments. Um, <clears throat> but um, on February 25, the staff approved Burlington Resources application for the well in question. Uh, March 6th, Watkins Road submitted a letter to the director requesting the commission suspend the APDs. On March 12, the commission uh, permit and technical services manager issued a suspension on the Chico APD. On March 23, 2018, uh, Watkins Road through its council filed an application uh, pursuant to Rule 305E2 requesting that the commission suspend the Chico APD. On March 29, Burlington filed a protest and demanded an expedited hearing. Uh, Rule 50305E2 does provide for expedited hearing, so I set it for an expedited hearing much to the chagrin of most of the staff because when was the last time we moved a case forward a hearing cycle? Um, <clears throat> since Rule 305E2 provides the director shall suspend the approval of the Form 2 and shall send the matter for an expedited hearing, and since there was sufficient time for the requisite publication, the matter was set on the April agenda for an expedited hearing. Case management order was issued and the final pre-hearing conference was set on April 23, 2018. On April 23, 2018 was also set as the settlement deadline in this case. After the final pre-hearing conference, a final pre-hearing order was also issued on April 23rd. Um, <clears throat> at 3.30 last Friday afternoon, the parties sent the hearing officer an email asking for a continuance because, and I quote, the parties have met and are continuing discussions for possible resolution of the issues. There was no discussion that we are close to an agreement, we have an agreement, or anything like that. We're just continuing to talk after they had ex requested an expedited hearing. <clears throat> after consultation between the hearing officer and the hearings manager, the request for continuance was denied. Staff had spent considerable time and effort on the requested expedited hearing, and the matter had already been sent out to the commissioners in their portfolio. It was therefore the commissioner's decision whether or not to grant the continuance. Staff would ask the commission to be aware that time spent on preparing the expedited hearing could have been spent on other matters. Uh, there are other matters that we could have put on the hearing agenda or on the consent agenda, and there are frankly a number of items that should have been on this consent agenda we just didn't have a chance to get to in large measure because of all of the protested cases. Now we're just going to throw all that time out, and uh, there's no guarantee this matter will settle. Uh, we may just go through this all again in June. The commission is at liberty to grant the continuance or require the parties to proceed to hearing, uh, and that's up to the commission. Uh, they should be prepared to go to hearing. This uh, 3.30 on the Friday afternoon before the hearing uh, is just really not acceptable time to be all of a sudden deciding you're going to talk about settlement and request a, a, a continuance. Can I ask a question? You bet. Any questions? Mr. Acting Chair, uh, you, you mentioned the settlement deadline that was established in your pre-hearing order, but I'm afraid I didn't catch what the date was. Can That's you say that again? I believe it was April 23. It was the same date as the pre-hearing conference, same date that the final pre-hearing order was issued. At that time, there was no uh, talk of continuing settlement. Okay. Thank you. Any response from the parties? Yeah. May I say anything about them? Yes. Thank you. Um, we understand the concerns of the staff. We also are very sensitive to the time that the staff puts into this. Um, if this motion is not granted, this would set a precedent from the commission that resolution is really not welcome. The parties have worked very long and hard to also get to the place to where there is a potential resolution on the table in an initial signed and executed letter agreement. Mr. Rouse's statement in our joint email stating that the parties are in discussions and negotiation was just that because the terms of that agreement are confidential. We did follow up, and this, the entire email chain is attached to your, your motion as Exhibit A. Um, we did follow up with a further explanation about what was happening between the parties with this. Um, so at this point in the proceedings, or at least I should say as of Friday, um, we were working very diligently as the parties with a surface owner and operator to reach a resolution that would ultimately take this out of the commission's standpoint and put it back in the operator surface owner discussions. Um, one of the main reasons we specifically as ConocoPhillips, I'm sorry, Burlington Resources did this um, 
is because of the statements that were made by this commission during the hearings in October when we had the extraction Cresto matters up. And I'm gonna read verbatim from the transcript that we have from that hearing. This was from um, Commissioner Boygan that states right before he gets into deliberations, it says, I think both parties are putting the commission in a very difficult spot. This should not be before this commission. This is something the parties should have worked out and work out amongst themselves. He then goes on to state, the operators should have sat down with each other and worked in agreement. And in my mind, the way I would think of it is yes, there's going to be impact on one or the other of our ruling for one or the other. The reason I bring that up is because we as operators and specifically in an instance with surface owners sometimes do have to bring issues in front of this commission that could otherwise not have been resolved. However, in this instance, we have worked very hard to reach a resolution prior to the hearing today, which is one of the reasons we continually reached out Friday and Saturday to the hearing staff to ensure that you as the commissioners didn't have to prepare for the hearings today. And you could have known about this Friday or Saturday and saved yourself the time and administrative efforts of reviewing it for purposes of today because we were set for an almost four hour hearing. And now we're asking you to clear your docket so you can bring that additional, any additional matters that are after that forward. Um, and again, I, I just wanna be very respectful to the staff because they're very good, you have very good staff. We just recognize that they're overburdened and that we want to be very sensitive to the time, but we cannot force parties to otherwise not reach resolutions, regardless of the time period, um, and, and try to continue these matters in, in order to facilitate those resolutions. So thank you for the opportunity to respond. Okay, Mr. Fierstein. Uh, yes, as, uh, as I mentioned in my opening remarks and also as you'll see in the, the email chain, um, Mr. Rouse did encourage the parties to uh, consider settlement. We did inform him that we were meeting for settlement purposes. We had that meeting. We reached a, a deal in concept that day. Uh, the paperwork, we papered that uh, initial letter, letter agreement on Friday, and that uh, contains, as I said, the metrics. Surface use agreements uh, completed by May 30th uh, and a continuance of the hearing uh, to uh, June 11th and and you know I don't know that there's anything else I I can't say other than uh, to reiterate again we're very very surprised that um, that this this isn't continued it isn't already continued until uh, until the June hearing may I ask just okay. one more question of course um, was the first settlement meeting that you had among the two parties on Thursday April or excuse me Thursday March 29th no the the uh, the the permit, the actual, the actual, uh, the actual surface use area, the oil and gas operations area, was uh, discussed originally when the drilling permit and location 2A permit were were approved by the commission in 2015. Okay, then uh, the drilling permit expired. I'm sorry. Before you go much okay. further, I want to make sure that I'm just being clear okay. with my. Question. All right, and I'm, then, I'm wondering when the first, you said the pre hearing conference was last Monday. You reached an agreement in principle on Friday. It sounded like the first settlement meeting that you had among the parties was on Thursday. No. No. May I? Thank you, Chair or Commissioner. Um, the parties have engaged in numerous settlement discussions. Um, the meeting on Thursday was, I'm going to say, an extension of certain of those meetings with the intention of if a resolution was to be reached as to the hearing on Monday. Um, that was one of the main focuses of the meeting on Thursday as a result of our pre-hearing conference on Monday the 23rd. So the, the parties have been in discussions on this for a very long time. And I, I don't want to go into the merits of this case right now because I think that that's um, probably beyond the scope of this hearing. But um, it was not the first settlement discussion um, on Thursday. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Commissioner yeah. Jolly. Um, I'd like to commend um, Hearing Officer Rouse for trying to move this along. Um, we get generally get these packages Thursday, Friday, um, and that takes me Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday to prepare for this. And uh, this one actually came in on Wednesday, I think. I think you guys have been dispute in dispute for since 14 or 15. I don't know. 2000. It, it seems like it's just come to a head. But um, I spent. Um, I had an extra day this week 
to study, and I studied this on Wednesday. So um, we have a lot of stuff coming at us. A consent agenda takes a long time to look at. So it is uh, distressing when these, from my perspective, to see these get um, pulled at the last minute. Although I do appreciate you trying to work it out. I'll offer hearings officer Rouse any reply if you'd like. Um, and then we can open up for questions and then deliberate quickly. Well, I'm not sure why they think this is set for a four hour hearing. I allotted one hour per side to present their cases. Um, and we are experiencing quite a bit of this. And I believe you have another uh, matter you wanted to report on and you can see it in that one also. Parties just filing whatever they want, whenever they want. And it makes it extremely difficult to have an orderly process. Uh, we set that settlement date um, as part of the case management order at the request of one of the commissioners and the suggestion. It sounded like a really good idea. And, um, you know, here we are still with last minute continuances and settlements and requests. And I, you know, this was not a matter of where they came in and said, we've settled, we want a continuance, we just need to sign the paperwork Wednesday instead of Monday. Uh, the initial uh, matter presented to us was we're talking about it. That's all I have to say. All right, so commissioners, any other questions for the parties? Um, and we can close testimony. Other questions? No? Okay, I'll close testimony. Um, and what's the pleasure? May, may I make a comment and then you may. follow it up with a motion? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I, I think that um, I think that this commission does encourage settlement and does encourage the um, joint resolution of issues. And so I think the continuance should be granted by the commission. But with that being said, um, I think this is incredibly this is an incredibly um, difficult position to put both the staff and the commission in. And I want to make sure that the attorneys and the parties that are involved in this matter and the attorneys and the parties that are listening understand that this is not acceptable behavior. Um, the, the commission hearing officer executed an order that had a deadline in it for settlement agreements. Um, that deadline should be respected. If there's movement towards a settlement agreement in advance of the deadline that's identified in a, in a hearing officer order, that should be communicated to the hearing officer and an amendment to that order should be requested in a timely fashion. Um, reaching a settlement Friday in the afternoon before a hearing that's scheduled to be um, to occur on Monday is not fair to the staff. It's not fair to the commissioners like Commissioner Jolly. I also spent a significant amount of time preparing for this matter that I could have spent doing my other job or doing something as quaint as spending time with my child. Um, I, I would also like to say that I think the acknowledgement that staff is overburdened, while it's nice to have that acknowledgement, I would like to point out that I think one of the reasons why staff is overburdened is because of procedural maneuvering like this that does not allow staff to move through their docket in a timely fashion. So while I will be voting in favor of continuing this matter, um, I think this is not the type of behavior that we would like to see from parties moving forward. At least this commissioner would not like to see from parties moving forward. And so I would move to grant the motion. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion on the motion? Commissioner Walt. Just, uh, I'm just going to agree uh, with Commissioner uh, Overturf. I um, think we're less cranky about the settlement consideration than all the work and everything that went into prior um, uh, with the expedited hearing and, and, and all of the other dates that were put forward. So um, that's all I'd say. May I add one other thing? Commissioner Overturf. Um, I, I do think that if the settlement, um, if the settlement falls apart, I, I, I would recommend if this matter comes before the commission in another form, um, because the settlement deadline was not respected and adhered to, perhaps we could place this matter at the end of the queue. And I would 
defer to the hearing officer and the hearing staff about how exactly that would work, but um, in recognition that we do have these deadlines and they should be um, acknowledged and respected. Commissioner Jolly? I, I think that's a great idea. And I, I would clarify, I don't think that's a, an amendment to my motion, but rather just a suggestion for staff with which they can do what they please. All right, any more discussion? Okay, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes unanimously. Thank you for your time and consideration of this. Thank you and appreciate your comments. Duly noted. Thank you. And with that, I will pass the gavel symbolically back to Commissioner Boygan. Thank you. Ms. Uh, Commissioner Randall, I will try to live up to the high standard that you've set. <laughs> so um, we're going to take a break, I think. Um, but I, what I would like to ask staff to do is I don't see the attorneys here is to check with the attorneys for the other matter that was scheduled for this afternoon to see if we can move it up to start we first already, thing. They will be here directly after your consent. Oh, you're on top of it as always. Thank you. So we'll then um, finalize the timing for, for this afternoon as, as we get through this. So let's take a break now. Well, yeah, let's take a break now and then we'll have the director's report. That's great. Um, so let's reconvene here at 1125. Um, Bob covered the orphan wells piece and I did want to let the commissioners know that one of our employees, Rick Allison, was um, identified um, and selected as a recipient of one of the governor's awards and so we're extremely proud of the public service award he's received. Um, He's an environmental protection specialist covering Northern Weld County, and which is, as you know, one of the most active areas of oil and gas development. He covers a huge amount of workload responding to operators, public complaint, complaints, and other agency priorities, um, including work on the recently completed Upper Pierre Water Quality Study. So we're extremely proud of him and um, his acknowledgement from the governor's office. So I think that that is the entirety of my update at this point in time. Um, I'm happy to take any questions you all may have. Uh, I'd like to kick it off and just ask either Director Murphy or Commissioner Randall whether the administration supported the bill that apparently was approved in the Senate on, on uh, changing the pooling procedures. I think we took no position on that. Um, and. I believe that Doug Bilsack, our legislative liaison, testified with no position saying we wanted to see, as Bob alluded to earlier, I'm sorry, Commissioner Randall alluded to earlier, wanting to see what the parties could work out, understanding that there were ongoing conversations. Thank you. Commissioners, any other questions or comments for Director Murphy? Commissioner Overturf? Um, I just wanted to follow up on some of the comments that we heard in, in the public comment period of today. Um, First, I'm wondering if you could provide some more information about the Boulder County um, petitions and, and the status of those. That's a great question. And if I can take all three briefly, um, can we bring staff in at some point between now and either before or after the consent agenda to answer your questions very specifically about that? Sure. Um, and kind of the same on the Swan Road application, um, which was the surface development, I believe that's in con that raised some questions during public comment. Um, the third one, um, the, nat the arsenal question, that is an item that's on your consent agenda. It's 18030262. Um, and Sorry, can you say that again? Sure. 18030262. It's in group D. Um, and I, uh, the applicant's attorney is present and staff is present. 
if as you're going through the consent agenda, you have questions and want to talk to them specifically about it based on the public comments. Um, but yes, Commissioner Overturf, I thank you for raising the other two. I plan to have staff available to give a quick presentation either before or after consent or at the conclusion of today's hearing. Commissioner Jolly. Um, are we also talking about what was referred to as the tollway? Um, the tollway is in group G. And yes, we would have staff available to answer questions about that as well. Any other questions, Commissioner Agar? On the um, the legislation on setbacks, that's for schools only. Do you know the distance? My recollection, and I will send you the bill separately, is that it's a thousand feet from the property line um, of schools. And then the force um, potentially uh, changing procedures for force pooling. You said clarification on the liability. Um, can you tell me a little bit of what that means? Um, there's an ongoing debate, is how I would characterize it, about whether a mineral owner who becomes a non-consenting owner um, becomes liable for, say, a pollution outcome of an event for lands in which their minerals are pooled. Um, this language, the goal of this language, as I understand it, would be to clarify that a non-consenting mineral owner would not be liable in that situation. Um, and then... Uh, I should clarify, there are some other substantive changes in the pooling language. It raises the um, the risk penalty amount for horizontal wells of a certain length. Um, and then it also changes the statutory royalty rate. So right now, um, a non-consenting owner re receives 12.5% um, with the remaining 87.5% um, going to paying off the costs and risk penalties, as outlined in the statute. That is raised, I believe, to 15% in this. But I should send you all the bill and stop quoting it. So. And so technically if those pass, we could see those in two weeks. Those, yep. That'll get resolved in two weeks or we'll have a decision. Yep. And then um, what's the process look like after that as far as how that comes down to us? Um, I, to ensure that our rules are consistent with statute, we would probably need to make some changes to, I believe, only the 500 series to implement those pooling um, changes. So those would be coming to you and at some point in hopefully relatively short order subject to the appropriate process. Okay, thank you. Um, to follow up on Commissioner Agar's question, there, I'll, I'll just comment that there, there's language in the statute that says after recovery, for, for an unleased mineral owner who elects not to lease, does not elect to lease, and then becomes subject to the cost recovery penalty, after the recovery of that penalty, that owner becomes subject, among other things, to its his or her share of liabilities without any explanation of what that means. And so that's, I think, the basis for the debate for what does that mean. Um, and obviously a homeowner who's force pooled or really anybody who's force pooled, a mineral owner, doesn't want to be taking on liabilities of the operation, probably may not even want to be force pooled at all. That's, you've heard that in public comments many times but it's sort of adding insult to injury, the notion that not only are we potentially being forced pulled, but we might even have to bear some portion of liabilities. And so that's a, that's been a big concern. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Jolly. In the forced pooling discussions at the legislature, do you know if there's been any discussion about a minimum interest of what you, an operator needs to have to force pull? I haven't seen that in any of the bill language. Mr. Hawkins. So my question, I guess, would be that if the commission wanted to address some kind of minimum interest for force pooling, would we need that in a statute, or is that left to our commission to de decide? I would look to your counsel. Mr. Davenport, you have a comment on that? Thank you. I will. Um, <clears throat> I think the most accurate answer to that is the statute provides that any interested party 
may file an application to compulsory pool a unit that's been previously previously approved by the commission, a spacing unit. And so any interested party is a pretty broad term to me, and I think it has been interpreted by the courts in a different context, in the context of participation as a hearing. Uh, Section 108 of the Act provides that any interested party may participate, and there are a couple of decisions that interpret exactly what that means. So it has been, any interested party being able to file a forced pooling application is a pretty broad statement of who that's being, and it has traditionally been interpreted to say anybody who has a minimal, some, some interest in the spacing unit can file it. Before I give you a definitive answer of exactly what your powers are, I'd like to do a little more work and look at it specifically, and I think that would probably include some advice in executive session, potentially. I can just tell you that's the current status of things. Uh, Commissioner Hawkins? Just, uh, I guess my <coughs> concern there is that it's, <clears throat> if the statute's silent, you know, and you're going to take a look at that, um, you know, what we're talking about or what I'm talking about is being able to put some conditional uh, parameters into the rule that doesn't violate what the statute asks, but still gives us a little more cons uh, control over what we might, how we might choose to enact a rule for that statute. Um, and I think it, while we're looking at that, it'd probably be helpful to understand what some other states, even though they have their own statutes and maybe they have to deal with that, but, you know, just to give us some relative comparison of what other states how they handle force pooling and I know I think that's come up before and we probably have some of that already done so anyway that's my question on that thank you Commissioner Hawkins um, I will follow up with, with this comment um, the rules dealing with pooling are ancient in the commission rules, um, we've seen and are seeing um, a real surge in um, pooling issues and controversies before us. This afternoon is another example. We've had them the last several months, as I recall, the last several hearings. Um, and so, um, building on Commissioner Hawkins's comments, um, I would like to get the director's thoughts, not necessarily today, but maybe at the next hearing, on whether it would be appropriate to take a look at the rules in light of the existing statute, because we don't know whether the statute will be amended or not, but even if it is, um, and, and in light of the controversies that staff has been dealing with, and, and consider making a recommendation about whether some changes ought to be considered. Chair, if it pleases you, um, we could certainly bookend either 30 minutes or an hour to do a work session on pooling with you in the July or the June hearing. My apologies. You, so. Thank you. That'd be great. Great. Any other comments from commissioners? One more question. Commissioner Agar. This goes back to you, Executive Director's report. Um, it sounded like there was no money, additional money provided or in legislation for orphan wells, but in your long bill, there's, um, I guess, requests to increase authorization for spending on orphan wells. Does that sound right? Um, when, what timeline is that for approval? Is that going to be potentially approved within two weeks? Your bill, long bill? Um, this Commissioner Randall, um, for the record. Um, yeah, so the long bill is actually getting signed this afternoon, so it will become law today. Um, and I don't know, I, I haven't looked at the savings clause. I don't know when it goes into effect. I assume the spending authority would be available on July 1, um, just like the rest of the provisions of the budget. Um, so was there, um, so that's the answer as to timing. Was there? Yeah, there, and so I think when we, when we, um, approved the increase to the mill levy, one of the things we talked about was let's see what happens with the legislature and we may have to come back. And so 
I guess once that happens, I would like to hear what that means for us and what the commission has planned for, for that money and how it would be directed towards Orphan Wells. And if it would be, thank you, sorry. Um, Commissioner Ager, I think we can also have Wendy or um, I provide a quick budget update about where we are, where we're going um, on that topic also in June, if that's agreeable. Yep, thanks. Thank you. Any other comments from commissioners? Uh, yeah, Mr. Chairman, Mr. I do. Holton. Uh, for Director Murphy, how much staff time is spent on these operator disputes, the sandbox cases? Um, so sharing a little bit of our dirty laundry, we've been in a staffing crisis um, recently at, on the hearing side. And so I made the decision in, I think, early April that we should prioritize getting um, hearing matters resolved as opposed to consent agenda. And so to that end, we have a more limited number of consent agenda items than we normally do. And so I think that that's I can't give you an hours. We don't we don't keep our time that way. Um, we're not quite as rigorous as the private legal community. Um, I can't tell you by the tenth of the hour how much time we spend on contested items versus um, non-contested items. But it has been significant, and um, we really prioritize trying to get those moving through the system in the last hearing cycle. Um, Do we make them go through independent mediation before they come to us? Um, that's not a requirement of our rules, Commissioner. Maybe that's something we look at. Do they have a civil, uh, civil remedy before they come to the commission? Not typically. Um, in my experience with administrative law, district courts like the agency to consider, consider the matter before the district court weighs in. I mean, I would request the rest of the commissioners that we look into this. We've been dealing with this for three to four years, and it's just getting worse. Um, I don't like the fact that we've got to come in and do the mediation between two operators that can't come to an agreement. So I think there needs to be something else in place where they get their stuff done. Commissioner Holton, um, I take your point. I think probably most members of the commission feel the same way. I know I do when I read through some of the materials that have been submitted to us. Um, and I'll just comment that I think some of the disputes that come before us are attempting to drag the commission into private contractual matters, or private legal matters, legal disputes, or to use the commission as leverage um, in these private business disputes. And I think given the time that all of us have to spend absorbing these materials, reading through um, burdensome and repetitive motions, trying to get a procedural edge, um, I, speaking for myself, it's, um, it's getting old, and I've only been on the commission for less than a year. So, um, Commissioner Holton, I think a lot of us share your frustration, concerns about the process, and um, not sure what to do about it at this point other than to continue to express that concern. And um, maybe we can have some discussion around how to... Um, modify the process to encourage what we saw today, frankly, was which was apparently a settlement that we hope will occur on a matter that was contested, even though we're, the Commission wasn't too happy about sort of the last minute nature of it, but obviously we want to encourage settlement. So, um, Director Murphy, I don't know if you want to make a comment. I, my well, comment, sorry, go ahead. Commissioner Holton. I think that, uh, I mean, last time, I think we heard that the courts are actually, the judges are starting to turn stuff back over to us, which isn't right. So I would like the commissioners to take a serious look at this to help out staff so they're not burdened with this stuff, and the commission is not. I mean, we go through three to four hour hearings because two operators can't sit down and make an agreement between themselves. Director Murphy? My comment is an open ask for suggestions. I think there are a lot of bright minds working on this issue, and if there are suggestions, I'm happy to take them. Um, well, and I'd like to look at, at independent mediation, too. But they should have to go through that before they come in front of us. I might suggest that we ask for input from the bar, from the commission, those who practice before the commission on... Um, 
what they see as whether they even recognize or agree that there's a problem or is there something that ought to be addressed? Are there procedures that ought to be looked at? Um, we've got a staffing issue. We've got a, an issue, as Commissioner Holton points out, of is the commission the right forum? Does it have the expertise? Should it be dealing with some of the issues that are coming up? Um, those are legitimate questions, and perhaps we ought to invite some input. Mr. Yep. Chair? Commissioner Overturf. Um, I was I was planning on talking about this in the context of a of a matter that's scheduled for tomorrow, but um, but I will just raise at a at a high level some suggestions that I have. Um, one would be that we we do have the legal authority, is my understanding, to charge an application fee of up to two hundred dollars per application. I would recommend that we start imposing application fees for all applications that are filed, and I would also recommend that the commission staff articulate some guidance about what renders an application complete, what is the minimum amount of information and level of specificity that's required for commission staff to be able to adequately um, evaluate any application that's filed. If an application is filed that does not have that information, um, I think it should be summarily rejected and the applicant should need to refile its application and pay another application fee um, once it has obtained the information that is Required for the application to be complete. Um, I think there are a lot of um, circumstances where it, my impression is that operators are so concerned about being the first person to file that they may not be filing a document that is of sufficient quality and that in order for the commission to um, manage its workload, it needs to better align the incentives of operators with the in with what helps the commission run smoothly. Well, and I think this goes along with Commissioner Hawkins' concern about percentage of uh, who owns the royalties or the right to drill. I think it goes along with that too, because we've seen cases where we had a 900 acre unit that was held up by somebody that had 17 acres. So I think there needs to be a consideration for that as well. Any other um, commissioner comments? Commissioner Jolly. Yeah, on the, on the discussion of um, the judges in Garfield County, there's three or four judges now that aren't take that are punting as much as possible to the commission on payment of uh, on payment of proceeds cases, and then there's also a bunch in Denver, and I'm wondering as a commission there's some way we can send a signal to these judges that that's a contractual dispute you need to take you know quit quit asking us to do it Has anybody got any suggestions of whether we have some format or some method in in telegraphing that to these judges um, before I respond I'll ask director Murphy or or hearing officer Prine, if she wants to respond. Um, I think that payment of proceeds and establishing a process to move those cases through is a priority for us. Again, we're falling into this lack of resource staffing resources realm. We do have two new hearing officers coming on this month, which is great news. Um, but that lag time will continue. But I agree that we need to establish a clear way to address and resolve these cases and. Um, help the district courts understand our perspective as well. And I would just well, add, and I would uh, go ahead, Commissioner Holton. Um, I would like to have uh, Attorney General Davenport kind of do a little bit of research on this to see exactly what we can do about it, what our responsibilities are, and if we can shove this back to the court system instead of in front of us. Thank you, Commissioner Holton. So my comment was somewhat similar. Um, I think that the appropriate form or the way to address that issue is to um, address it in the context of a matter that comes before us. Um, there are a few apparently that are working their way through the system through staff and ultimately will get to us for a hearing of some sort. At that point, we ought to have legal advice 
from the Attorney General on um, the jurisdiction of the commission to hear the matter. And we, I would suggest, we as a commission ought to rule on whether we think we have jurisdiction to hear the matter. If we decide that we don't, then it will get kicked back to the courts. If we decide that we do, then we'll proceed to deal with it. Director Murphy. I think that sounds reasonable and we'll work towards that. Okay, uh, any other comments? Commissioner Overture. Are we doing just regular commissioner comments right now or are we still doing the director's report? <laughs> well, well, um, whatever your pleasure is. Well, then I'll wait for my turn. Okay, well then, why don't we go directly into commissioner comments? <laughs> Are you done, Director Murphy? Well, report from the Secretary. Um. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a few things. Um, <clears throat> you all should have received the new rules um, after the flow line rulemaking. Several of our rule series have changed. Um, those were completed. You should have received an email with those. I'm happy to make you a printed copy. If you would like one um, for your rule binders, please just let me know and I'll get going on that. Um, if I'm redundant, I apologize, uh, Director Murphy and I kind of had the same thoughts going. Um, in your agenda, there is a typo I want to bring your attention to real quick in Group B. There is a matter listed as 18010190. That should actually be 18030190. Um, what group was that? Uh, group B, as in boy. Uh, as Director Murphy indicated, we do have staff available after lunch. Can you say that again? Sure, I'm sorry. 18010190 in Group B should be 18030190. I, I believe all the materials you received were the correct docket number. It just got um, a typoed on the agenda. Um, as Director Murphy pointed out, we do have staff available after lunch to give you updates on the SWAN permit, um, also on Boulder <laughs> County, the CDP, and the 8 North applications. Currently, the 8 North applications are scheduled for your July hearing. And I believe the SWAN permit is still open for, for uh, comment on our website until the middle of May. But there will be staff here to answer your independent questions. Um, as well as if you have questions on the Petro company spacing application that is in front of you and the consent agenda that you heard about at the Rocky Mountain Arsenal and the pooling application from Western Gas um, that you had some public comment on. So we will have staff available to answer your questions. Um, lastly, I, oh, uh, we've also had some audio problems this morning. Um, if you receive any emails, I believe we're back up at this point, but um, we are having some issues on that front. Uh, Director Murphy pointed out that we have some staffing issues at the hearing unit. Um, I just want to make you all sort of aware of good news, bad news on that front. Um, the good news is we do have two new hearing officers starting in May. They are terrific. I'm anxious to get them going. One of the first projects we were going to give one of them is on the payment of proceeds uh, process and also a jurisdictional question. I will make sure that he works closely with the Attorney General's office to make sure we're giving you the information you need on that. Um, the bad news. <laughs> the bad news is we have 340 pending matters as of right now. Um, so uh, I know that members of the bar who practice in front of you are frustrated and we are as well. No one likes to come to work and feel like they're already behind when they walk in the door. So we are working as hard as we can to get things done as quickly as possible. Um, but it's an enormous workload. 
We are down one hearing officer. We lost a hearing officer in early April. Um, and so we've been struggling to try to get as much done with her gone as possible. Uh, continuing on the bad news, um, hearing officer Rouse will be out for several weeks with a health issue. I will also be out for part of May. So I do not anticipate that June will be a good time for us to play catch up. Um, but my assumption is by July, we should start to get more matters in front of you because the new hearing officers will be geared up and we'll all be back and running. So um, as you know, the applications that come before you go through a very long process internally, not just with the hearings office, but with permitting and engineering as well. Um, so we will continue to push as many matters as we can to you, but I would not anticipate that June will be a big step up for us, given everything we're dealing with. Um, the current agenda, Mr. Chair, you wanted to ask about that. Um, we have contacted the attorneys for the second general hearing on your docket, the four o'clock Highlands Renegade Matters. We have contacted them and let them know that they need to move their timing up to right after the consent agenda. I am happy to have staff here right after lunch before the consent or after the consent, whichever works. If you want, I guess, if let me back up. If you want more information on the two matters that are on your consent agenda, um, I can have staff here directly after lunch before you vote on those. Thank you, um, Mr. Jolly. Was the tollway going to be one of those on that uh, list also? Yes, Commissioner, Commissioner Jolly, the tollway um, matter is the 314 matter that you heard in public comment. It is a pooling, or, uh, pooling application that is on the consent agenda. It's in your Group G currently. Right. So I can have staff to discuss that matter before consent, if you would like. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other um, comments from commissioners on on any of those matters? I think Mr. Chairman, Commissioner Holton, I just want to make it sure, make it clear to staff that all of my frustration and comments were not directed towards staff. Director Murphy, thank you, Chair, or thank you, Vice Chair Holton. Um, Commissioner Holton, I think we all understood it that way, but I'm glad you clarified it. Um, and I think doing it right after lunch with staff on those matters makes sense. So um, now we get to um, Commissioner's comments. Commissioner Overturf, I think you wanted to kick it off. This is perhaps less a comment than a, than a request for um, to greedily utilize some of the brain power that does exist among our staff, um, which is that as I've listened to public comment and, and reviewed some of the complaints that the commission receives, I'm very, and given that I was not involved in prior, I have not been on the commission for that long and I wasn't involved in prior iterations of rulemakings that led to the current rules we have now, I would like to better understand how commission staff um, considers to the cumulative impacts of development on particular communities and how that weighs into subsequent applications for activity that's in a location where there's already a significant amount of drilling activity. Um, I'm thinking specifically in regards to um, a lot of the odor and noise complaints that we've gotten. And so I'm curious to understand the extent to which that's considered um, and and how it's considered if it is. So that's not to request a specific working meeting among the commissioners because I may be the only one that has this uh, interest, but I would like to um, set up a time with technical staff to better understand that issue. Director Murphy. I'm happy to make staff available. Commissioners, um, Commissioner Walk. Um, yeah, just um, 
I want to say for the record that um, I also pay attention uh, to public comment and um, specific to as it might relate to the Department of Public Health and Environment. Uh, I took a couple of notes uh, that uh, I intend to provide uh, some feedback uh, to the Commission on, uh, one of which is this uh, Genova um, diagnostic test for VOC um, blood levels. Uh, I'm not familiar with that test, uh, and so I've asked uh, some of our folks at CDPHE to um, do some checking for me so that then I can um, report that back uh, to the Commission. Uh, and then the second was uh, Mr. Yelnick uh, with the map of the arsenal and um, uh, some of the comments that he made, uh, uh, CDPHE being involved in obviously uh, the remediation uh, and working with uh, the government or the U.S. government or the federal government uh, on that site. Um, I thought it bared um, just doing some investigation on our end as well. Uh, to see what, if anything, we know about uh, some of the uh, statements that, that he had made. And so, um, I, you know, I intend to do a little bit of follow-up on both those issues and bring them back to the Commission at some point. Thank you, Commissioner Walk. Uh, Commissioner Hawkins? Um, I was just going to raise that issue about the Rocky Mountain <coughs> Arsenal concerns, and I'm glad to hear Commissioner Walk's going to take a look at that, so that's great. Thank you. So I guess we've sort of um, pre foreshadowed what we're going to talk about this afternoon on the consent agenda. Um, with that matter, anyway, um, any other comments commissioners want to make? Mr. Chairman? Mr. Halton? Um, I would like to be involved in the executive session that, uh, you know, for lunch break. But if the Attorney General thinks that that might be problematic, then I will acquiesce to his decision. Un unless there's a technical, this is Assistant Attorney General Kyle Davenport, unless there's a technical issue that would prevent us from being able to keep that as a, a private privileged communication, I don't have an issue with um, Commissioner Holton participating. So, uh, Commissioner Holton, I guess we'll check in with technical staff just to make sure, but I don't really foresee a problem. So, you're absolutely okay. welcome to participate. Thank you. Okay, Commissioners, any other comments? All right, so it looks like we have a lunch break with executive session. Um, and then we will do the consent agenda when we reconvene, which includes both, but it includes uh, consent agenda and enforcement, consent and enforcement matters, correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. And prior to consent, we will have staff here to answer questions right, on those matters. Right, right. Thank you for reminding me um, on, on the matters that we've um, asked questions about. Um, and so then uh, we will consider the contested matter at the conclusion of those discussions, correct? Yes, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Davenport, I understand that um, we have matters to discuss in executive session at, over lunch? That's correct, Mr. Chair. I have a, a brief little script I need to read, and then I'll encourage you to... Uh, invite a motion to enter an executive session. Um, pursuant to the open meetings law, the commission is entitled to enter into executive session at this regular meeting for the purpose of discussing pending or imminent court action with the commission council and to receive legal advice pursuant to Colorado revised statute section 246402 3A Roman 2. Topics of this executive session were identified on the agenda for executive session. We also have another matter that I'd like to add to the executive session now. Um, and those matters are in regard to the Court of Appeals opinion in Marilex et al. v. COGCC 17 CA 0051 to receive legal analysis and advice on the findings of the court and in regard to appealable issues in the opinion. Um, in regard to standards for approving spacing applications to receive legal advice and analysis of required criteria for approving drilling and spacing units under 3461.16, 
as well as other factors that may be used to decide between competing spacing applications. That's the second matter. Third matter is uh, to receive legal advice and analysis on individual commission communications with public on petitions for rulemaking and other communications. Fourth matter is to receive legal advice and analysis on the Adams County District Court's grant of summary judgment in COGA and API v. City of Thornton, 17 CB 31640. And finally, to receive legal advice and analysis of the claims and defenses in the recent litigation of Larson Front Range Farms at all v. COGCC, which is in the District Court for the City and County of Denver, and that's 18 CB 31404. <coughs> Chairman Benton, or excuse me, Chairman Boygan, I invite you to encourage a motion to enter an executive session for the matters and purposes I just named. Um, I will invite that motion, but I just want to ask whether you think an hour is um, enough time. I, I do like think an hour, an hour is enough time. We're going to move through most of those items, I think, pretty quickly. Okay, well, then I'll invite a motion for us to go into executive session to consider the matters specified by Mr. Davenport. Move that we move in, go into executive session. So it's, it's been moved and seconded. Any <coughs> comment? Uh, let's vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 All those opposed? Okay, we are adjourned for the hour for executive session. Director Murphy. With, are you planning to reconvene at 115 or 130? Let's do, uh, let's, Let's do 120. How about that? Perfect. Um, Keep everybody on their toes. Okay. Are we? Is it? Uh, before we go, I apologize. Is it clear on the record who's here? We had people That's coming it. in and out a little right. bit. Commissioner Wolk and Commissioner Randall joined us during public comment this morning. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.